We are on live now. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to this session of Innovations um, Recent webinar. We are actually gathered here together to talk about WASH, which is water and sanitation uh, and hygiene. This episode particularly looks at uh, in the part of the whole series where we have been discussing 50 years progress in the development sector of Bangladesh. Now, you already might have seen or been a part of this discussion. Um, this has been one of the last ones where we particularly look at the sector in Bangladesh since independence. Where have been the challenges? What has been the progress thus far? And where the development uh, concerns or amazing things that has been progressing in the past few decades as is lying. So we have esteemed panelists and we have our guests and special guests joining us today where we will be talking about particularly in depth about what has we achieved or what has been going on thus far. So without further ado, I would like to first uh, say a couple of house rules, which is very, very important for us to be reminded of as we go live. And you know, now this and day and age, everything's going on live. There could be some technical aspects that everyone needs to be mindful of. So I'm just going to quickly whiz through them. So today's agenda uh, would be to look into the achievements, like I said, and challenges of water and sanitation and hygiene sector in Bangladesh across the decades, starting from a chronological overview of critical but neglected sector. We are talking about um, the um, areas where we normally don't talk about the, we call it the periphery or those who don't often take the central stage of discussion. The webinar will take us through a journey of the pivotal events and in initiatives that have shaped Bangladesh's wash landscape. And mind you, this landscape is really, really vast. So let's further go into what we are uh, going to be conducting this session about. So a couple of house rules before we start. There is a Q&A chat box, which would be shown if you press on your the bubble speech on your chat function, everyone should have that. It should be showing on the right side of your screen. And please submit your questions using that chat box. Uh, we have got our technical team who would be addressing them and the panelists who will be answering to them as we go through. But in case there are some pressing ones that we need to bring forth, we will discuss it further, but we would like to address them um, as much as possible. The other thing is this session is being recorded. So anyone who has um, come here, attended, we will take it as a consent unless otherwise you raise it with us that you don't want to be a part of this recording, please contact the host team and they will sort it out for you. Um, otherwise, this is also going on live on our Facebook page and this could be shared. So anyone who's wanting to share it, you can share it. The social media is heavily involved with this session. Moving further through, so what we have, uh, I think this session is very much time bound. So without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Rubait Sawa, Managing Director and Lead Consultant of Innovation Consulting Private Limited, to do the welcome address. Thank you so much, Saima, um, for, for being with us today, joining from London. I welcome everyone. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, depending on which time zone you're joining from. So um, I'm Rubaiyat Sarwar, Managing Director and Lead Consultant Innovation, and I welcome you all to today's session. I believe uh, many of you have been participating in the webinars that we have been organizing under the Bangladesh Miracle, celebrating 50 years of development progress of Bangladesh series. Bangladesh Miracle is an exclusive uh, integrated development dialogue campaign being organized by Innovation in association with the Department of Economics, North South University and the Financial Express. Uh, also, we have with us um, our thematic partners supporting us for each individual webinar dialogues. And today we have a fortune to have with us WaterAid supporting us in organizing today's session and bringing to you a very powerful panel involving academia, the uh, development practitioners, researchers, and as well as um, um, the private sector 
um, and social businesses working on water and uh, sanitation hygiene solutions in Bangladesh. Um, so um, this is the seventh episode. We still have the final episode on extreme poverty, uh, which will be happening in two weeks time and we will send you the notification and that will mark the end of the uh, first series and we will soon be having the second series uh, right after. Without further ado, Simon, over to you. Thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you very much for your introductory um, welcome, uh, Rubait Sawar. And so I would like to, for those of you who are joining us now and watching us live, welcome. Um, so as Rubait Sawar says, I'm joining from London and uh, this is a very fine morning here. I am sure many of you are uh, in, well into the time zone as, as I speak. So um, can I just take this opportunity to introduce our panelists today? So we have got two uh, sessions uh, and, uh, with panelists and speakers. So uh, let me introduce them one by one. So keynote speaker of the webinar, Dr. Mohammad Karul Islam. He's the Regional uh, Director of South Asia Water Aid. So you, as you've heard, Water Aid is one of the partners um, so um, the Praise Lam will be presenting the keynote speech and we have a very rich um, panelist today. So first of all, uh, welcoming Nazma Nahar, uh, Dr. Nazma Nahar. She is the Professor of Department of Civil and Eng Environment Engineering, North South University. Then we'll, we've got Dr. Mohamed Mafizur Rahman, a Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, Buet. We got Shafiq Naim Khan, project manager, Sanmark 2, funded by UNICEF and SDC, implemented by IDE Bangladesh. So for our first session, uh, there will be the panel speakers. The second session panel speaker consists of Rumat Ashraf, Re regional director, Middle East and Latin America, Habitat Po, Minhas Chaudhry, CEO, Trinkwell, and uh, last but not the least, Rumat Sawa, Managing Director and Lead Consultant, Innovation Consulting Limited. Each of the panelists will have a certain number of time to kind of like say the questions and address the questions. And for concluding remarks, we have uh, Dr. Hussein Zilur Rahman, um, Executive Chairman, PPRC. We all know how um, esteemed and um, resourceful he is, and he will be actually summing up this whole conversation the discussion and the presentation. And later on, we will be looking at some outcomes, I think very fruitful ones um, after this, during his remarks. So um, shall we press on? And uh, this is kind of like the event schedule. I've already mentioned that. So let's start the first round of our panel session. So for this, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker. Um, and uh, so first of all, we've got the panelist. Is that the panelist or the keynote speaker? I think that's the panelist, isn't it? Sorry, we've lost the screen. Okay, so um, please bear with us because of the technical transition, we will be taking a few minutes to set up. So while we are doing this, um, let me just uh, say a few speaker. words. Sorry? It will be keynote speaker. Yes, that's what my understanding was. So we will uh, just um, invite Dr. Islam to, we can see a slide. Can this uh, slide be like full screen, please? Is it uh, full screen that? now? No, uh, it's, uh, it should be on the, um, the presentation mode, the top. So after save, you've got another live button on the top that's red. Yes, but for some reason it is taking a different kind of shape. Are, are you seeing it fully screen now or is it still a partial one? No, it's a partial one, but I think we, we can still um, work on Manage this, it. Dr. Yeah. Islam. Okay, that's I, absolutely think, I think fine. Yes, let's, let's, let's we go look like forward that. To your project and your observation. Um, sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, 
I believe uh, you are able to see these slides. Uh, this is basically, I will be presenting uh, 50 years of water sanitation and hygiene in Bangladesh. And uh, actually this presentation is prepared as a part of the, or as a chapter of a book, which is to be published soon. And quite a number of people uh, contributed in this chapter writing. I'm one of them and I'm presenting on behalf of them. So the first thing, I mean, I will not get into the details, uh, but uh, what I would like to remind people that in this subcontinent, if you recall, especially in, in Diden, East Pakistan or East Bengal, actually, uh, what happened is the very first uh, scientific installation of pipe supply was actually made by the, the Nov family in Dhaka, Kaza, Abdul Ghani. Uh, and those who are familiar with old city, uh, I mean, to Bangla transfer Kuri, Sheta Hutsa Je Puruno Dhaka, Chok Bajar Er Kathe, Chadni Ghate, Akta Power Plant, I mean, Pani Rekta Plant, that's it. সেখানে হলো ঢাকার প্রথম পানি সাপ্লাইতে এসেছিল এবং বাংলাদেশে প্রথম টিউব ওয়েল এস্টাবলিশড হয় হচ্ছে 1928 সালে এবং 30 এর দশকে এই দেশের মানুষ প্রথম টিউব ওয়েল দেখতে পায় এবং তারপরে আরেকটা ইম্পর্টেন্ট ল্যান্ডমার্ক সবার জেনে থাকলে ভালো হবে সেটা হচ্ছে আমরা যেটাকে ডিপিএইচই বলি সেটা হচ্ছে 1960 কিন্তু আমরা যে কারণে আজকে 50 বছর বলছি এটা হচ্ছে আমাদের স্বাধীনতা যুদ্ধ শুরু হয়েছিল 1971 সালে এবং আমরা সেই সময় রেফারেন্সটা দিতে প্রায় ভুলে যাই এবং আমি একটুখানি সময় নিব সেটা হচ্ছে যে আপনাদের হয়তো মনে থাকবে যে আজকে আমাদের রোহিঙ্গাতে 8 লক্ষ মানুষ এসেছে আমরা কত ওভারওয়েলমড হয়ে গেছি কিন্তু 71 সালে যুদ্ধের সময় এক কোটি মানুষ 7.5 কোটি মানুষ থেকে এক কোটি মানুষ ভারতের বিভিন্ন রাজ্যে আশ্রয় নিয়েছিল শুধু পশ্চিমবঙ্গে এই 50 লক্ষ মানুষ বিভিন্ন ক্যাম্পে বাংলাদেশী থাকত এবং কোন কোন শহরে আসলে সেই শহরের জনসংখ্যার চেয়ে 10 গুণ 15 গুণ মানুষ বেশি থাকত এবং এই শরণার্থী শিবিরগুলো ছিল খুবই সোয়াম্পি ল্যান্ডে একটা জলাধারের কাছে একটু নিচু জায়গায় যেখানে সামন্য বৃষ্টি হলে পানি জমে যায় এবং তখনকার দিনে খুব একটা ল্যাট্রিনেট চলটল ছিল না তো ওই পানির কাঁচা কাঁচি থাকায় যেটা সুবিধা হতো যে ওখানে থেকেই পানি নিচ্ছে ওখানেই শৌচকার্য হচ্ছে এবং ইয়ে তার ফলে যেটা হলো যে মে মাসের দিকে মে মাসের শেষের দিকে পশ্চিমবঙ্গে প্রথমে তারপরে পুরো শরণার্থী শিবির জুড়ে পুরো এমন একটা কলেরা তৈরি হলো যে সেই কলেরার মহামারীতে লক্ষ লক্ষ শরণার্থী মারা গিয়েছিল এবং আমাদের একটা সেপারেট গবেষণা চলছে যে কত লক্ষ মানুষ সেই কলেরা মহামারীতে মারা গিয়েছিল সেটাও আমরা বের করব এবং সেই সময়ে কলেরা ভ্যাকসিন দিয়ে এবং প্রথমবারের মতো ওআরএস এর একটা মাস স্কেল অ্যাপ্লিকেশন করে আমরা জীবন বাঁচিয়েছি কিন্তু আমি যে জিনিসটার কারণে ইতিহাসটা বললাম সেটা হচ্ছে সেই সময়ই প্রথম আমরা অনুধাবন করতে পারলাম যে এই ডায়রিয়া কলেরা এই জাতীয় রোগের জন্য আসলে টিউব ওয়েল অর্থাৎ সুপেয় পানি এবং একটা ভালো স্যানিটারি ল্যাট্রিন না হলে আসলে আমরা এই সমস্ত আমাদের জীবন যাপন এবং জীবন বাঁচাতে পারবো না এবং সেখানে এই প্রথম ওয়াটার স্যানিটেশন এবং হাইজিনের যে একটা জনস্বাস্থ্যগত গুরুত্ব রয়েছে এই সেই গুরুত্বটা অর্থাৎ ওয়াশের গুরুত্ব প্রথম স্থাপিত হয় হচ্ছে উনিশশো সালে দেশ স্বাধীন হওয়ার পরে যে ঘটনাটা ঘটলো হোয়াট আই নিড টু এমফেসাইজ দ্যাট आवर স্টার্টিং পয়েন্ট অ্যাজ এ নেশন ওয়াজ ভেরি ভেরি রুডিমেন্টারি লেস দ্যান 1% স্যানিটেশন কভারেজ ঢাকা সিটি ছাড়া আর কোথাও কোনো পাইপ ওয়াটারের তেমন কোনো সোয়ারেজ লাইন ছিল না সারা দেশে অনলি 185000 টিউবওয়েল ছিল এবং মাত্র 36 টা মিউনিসিপালিটিতে সাধারণ কিছু পানির সাপ্লাই ছিল এবং ফার্স্ট ফাইভ ইয়ার প্ল্যানে আমাদের টার্গেট এত মডেস্ট ছিল বিকজ আমাদের আর্থিক সামর্থ্য ছিল না যে এক লক্ষ পঁচাশির সঙ্গে আরও এক লক্ষ চল্লিশ হাজার টিউব ওয়েল একুশ বাইশ হাজার ডিপ টিউব ওয়েল করে এবং তখন মাত্র দশটা থানাতে এখন যেগুলোকে আমরা উপজেলা বলি মাত্র দশটা থানায় স্যানিটারি ল্যাট্রিনের প্রভিশন ছিল এবং পাইলট হচ্ছিল 
সেই জায়গা থেকে শুরু করে একটা যুদ্ধ বিধ্বস্ত বাংলাদেশ থেকে এই পরিস্থিতি থেকে শুরু করে আমরা আজকে কোথায় এসছি সত্তর দশকে যদি আমি যাই আসলে আমরা মানে যুদ্ধ বিধ্বস্ত অর্থনীতি পুনরুদ্ধার এগুলো করতে করতে সময় চলে গেছে খুব সাবস্টেন্সিয়াল কাজকর্ম হয়নি কিন্তু আশির থেকে নব্বই দশক যেটা এটাকে ইন্টারন্যাশনাল ড্রিঙ্কিং ওয়াটার সাপ্লাই এবং স্যানিটেশন ডিকেট বলে এবং এই সময়টা প্রেসিডেন্ট এর সাথে আমল আপনাদের মনে থাকতে পারে যে উন্নয়ন বাজেট গুলো বেশিরভাগ দাতা নির্ভর ছিল এবং আমরা মোটামুটি সেই সময়ে ল্যাট্রিন এবং ডিপ টিউয়েল এবং টিউয়েল দেওয়ার চেষ্টা করেছে এবং দেশব্যাপী ছড়িয়ে গেছে এবং নব্বই দশকে এত বেশি টিউবওয়েল ছড়িয়ে গিয়েছিল যে তিরানব্বই সালে আমরা আসলে আর্সেনিক দেখতে পেয়েছি এবং ওই সময়ের ওই শেষের দিকে এসে ডিপিএইচই বুঝতে পারলো যে শুধু ডিস্ট্রিবিউট করলে এই ল্যাট্রিন আসলে লোকজন ব্যবহার করবে না তারা প্রথমবারের মতো ডিপিএইচই ইউনিসেফ একটা সোশ্যাল মোবিলাইজেশনের দিকে অর্থাৎ এটাকে ইঞ্জিনিয়ারিং সলিউশন থেকে এটাকে যে একটা সোশ্যাল সলিউশন সেই দিকটাতে গেলেন এবং দু সালের পরে এখানে ওপেন ডেফিকেশনের ভার যেটা চালু করেছিল এই ধরনের একটা সোশ্যাল মোবিলাইজেশন ভিত্তিক একটা প্রচন্ড রকমের বেগবান কর্মসূচি শুরু হলো এরপরে আপনাদের মনে আছে দু হাজার থেকে দু হাজার পর্যন্ত যেটা এমডিজির আমল কিন্তু সেইখানে একটা বিষয় ছিল যে তখনও তেতাল্লিশ শতাংশ মানুষ খোলা মাঠে মল ত্যাগ করে বাংলাদেশে কিন্তু এই এমডিজিটা কিন্তু এমডিজি সেভেন যেটা ওয়াটার স্যানিটেশন দিয়ে এটা কিন্তু এসছিল দু সালে মাত্র দশ বছর সময় পেয়েছি আমরা এবং দশ বছরে আমাদের টার্গেট ছিল যে যা অবস্থা আছে তার অর্ধেকে আমরা নামিয়ে আনবো অর্থাৎ উন্নতির দিক মানে মানে যেটা গ্যাপ রয়ে গেছে সেইটা তো আমরা দু হাজার সালে এসে দেখলাম যে আমরা পানির যে টার্গেট ছিল সুপেয় পানি সেটা অর্জন করতে পেরেছি কিন্তু আমরা স্যানিটেশনের টার্গেটটা খুব সামান্য একটু হারে মিস করেছি কিন্তু তারপরেও কেন বাংলাদেশের সুনাম এই এই স্লাইডটা যদি একটু দেখেন যে সুনামের মূল কারণটা হচ্ছে যে এই যে তেতাল্লিশ শতাংশের কাছাকাছি সেই জায়গা থেকে খোলা মাঠে মলত্যাগের হার সেখান থেকে আমরা দশ পনেরো বছরের মধ্যে এটাকে প্রায় শূন্যের কোঠায় নামিয়ে নিয়ে আসলাম যেটা আমাদের প্রতিবেশী দেশ পাকিস্তান ভারত নেপাল এই দেশগুলো করতে পারেনি এবং এর পেছনে এইটাই হচ্ছে একটা বাংলাদেশের একটা মানে মিরাকেল আমি বলবো এই মিরাকেলটার পিছনে আসলে যে কোনো সাফল্যের পেছনে অনেক কারণ থাকে তো এই মিরাকেলের পেছনে অনেক কারণের মধ্যে প্রধান যে কারণ আমি বলবো এটা হচ্ছে যে বাংলাদেশে একটা খুব কনসিস্টেন্ট পলিটিক্যাল লিডারশিপ অ্যান্ড সাপোর্ট ছিল এবং দু সালের পরে এটা অত্যন্ত দৃশ্যমান ছিল তারা মানে তাদের অ্যাকশনেও এবং তাদের পরিবীক্ষণে এটা প্রমাণ করেছে সেই সময় একটা ভালো জিও এনজিও কোলাবরেশন হচ্ছিল তারপরে সবচেয়ে বড় যেটা যে এমডিজির কন্ট্রিবিউশনে বিভিন্ন দাতা সংস্থা প্রায় দেশের অর্ধেক উপজেলায় ব্র্যাক ইউনিসেফ ওয়াটার এইড এনজিও ফোরাম নানান জনের মাধ্যমে দেশের প্রায় অর্ধেক উপজেলায় এগুলো করতে পারছিল বাকি অর্ধেক হচ্ছে আপনার ওই বাকি বাকি অর্ধেক হচ্ছে যেভাবে হচ্ছে সেটা হলো যে ডিপিএইচই সেগুলো করেছিল টিভি রেডিও এগুলোতে বেশ কিছু গিয়েছে এবং তার পাশাপাশি একটা জিনিস মনে রাখতে হবে এই দশকে কিন্তু আমাদের মাইক্রো ফিনান্সের মাধ্যমে মেয়েদের বেরিয়ে আসা ক্ষমতায়ন নারীর ক্ষমতায়নের একটা ব্যাপার ঘটেছে ফিমেল এডুকেশন স্কলারশিপ প্রোগ্রামের মাধ্যমে অ্যাডলেসেন্ট গার্লসরা আর কখনো ল্যাট্রিনে মানে খোলা মাঠে যেতে চাচ্ছিল না নারীদের বেরিয়ে আসার পাশাপাশি আরেকটা জিনিস যেটা মনে রাখতে হবে বিদ্যুৎ এবং যোগাযোগ ব্যবস্থার উন্নতি এবং সবশেষে বাড়ির আশেপাশের ঝোপঝাড়ও কিন্তু অনেক কমে যাচ্ছিল তো সব মিলিয়েই আসলে অনেক বিরাট একটা সাফল্য আমরা খুব অল্প সময়ে পেয়েছি এরপরে যে জিনিসটা দাঁড়ালো সেটা হচ্ছে যে আমাদের এসডিজির সময় আসলো যেখানে ডেফিনেশন গুলো অনেক বদল হয়ে গেল এবং গত পয়লা জুলাই একটা রিপোর্ট বেরোলো এই রিপোর্টের একটা ভালো দিক আপনারা কি স্লাইড গুলো দেখতে পাচ্ছেন মানে একটা নতুন গ্রাফ ফালা স্লাইড আছে এই মুহূর্তে আমরা 
এখন কি গ্রাফ সহ একটা স্লাইড এসছে বাংলাদেশের অবস্থান যথেষ্ট ভালো প্রায় আটানব্বই শতাংশ মানে অন্য টপ যারা আছে তাদের কাছাকাছি আমরা আছি আরেকটা ভালো খবর আমরা পেলাম সেটা হচ্ছে যে ওপেন ডেফিকেশনটা আমরা কিন্তু গত প্রায় সাত আট বছর ধরে ধরে রাখতে পারছি এটা কিন্তু অনেক দেশেই ওপেন ডেফিকেশন থেকে স্লিপেজ হয়ে আবার ফেরত যায় বাংলাদেশে এখন যেটা আছে সেটা হলো যে অত্যন্ত হতদরিদ্র পরিবারের কিছু মানুষের মধ্যে এখনো ওপেন ডেফিকেশন দেখা যায় কিন্তু বাই অ্যান্ড লার্জ হচ্ছে না কিন্তু এখানে একটা জিনিস আপনার নতুন একটা স্লাইডে দেখতে পাচ্ছেন তো নাকি জি খেলা ভাই পাচ্ছি আচ্ছা জি 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 তো ইন্ডিয়া নেপাল এবং পাকিস্তান এই তিনটা দেশ এই গত পাঁচ সাত বছরে এই পরিমাণ ইনভেস্ট করেছে স্যানিটেশনে যে আপনার আপনারা জানেন যে ইন্ডিয়াতে একশো বিশ কোটি মানুষ নেপালে পাকিস্তানে সব মিলিয়ে এত বিপুল পরিমাণ মানুষ গত পাঁচ সাত বছরে ওপেন ডেফিকেশন থেকে মুক্তি পেয়েছে যে সারা বিশ্বে দক্ষিণ এশিয়া একটা উন্নতি এনে দিয়েছে এবং বাংলাদেশ স্লিপেজ করেনি হাইজিনে বাংলাদেশের অবস্থানটা তুলনামূলক ভাবে অন্যদের তুলনায় বেশ দুর্বল ছিল কিন্তু আমার মনে হয় কোভিডের কারণে এখন যদি কারণ এই ডেটাটা তো কালেক্ট করা হয়েছিল উনিশে যদি এখন করা হতো কোভিডের পরে হয়তো আমরা একটা অন্যরকম চিত্র দেখব মেনস্ট্রুয়াল হাইজিন ম্যানেজমেন্টে একটা বাংলাদেশের গর্ব করার মতো একটা বিষয় আছে যে সারা পৃথিবীর মধ্যে শুধুমাত্র ইজিপ্ট এবং বাংলাদেশই সম্পূর্ণ ডেটা সেট দিতে পেরেছে এবং সারা পৃথিবীর মধ্যে মাত্র ছেচল্লিশটা দেশ যেখানে অন্যান্য ডেটা আছে প্রায় মানে এক দেড়শো পনে দুইশো দেশে সেখানে শুধুমাত্র এই দুটো মাত্র দেশ পুরো ডেটা দিয়েছে এবং মেনস্ট্রুয়াল হাইজিন মানে এটা এমনই নেগলেক্টেড যে মাত্র ছেচল্লিশটা দেশ ডেটা দিতে পেরেছে তো বাংলাদেশ তাদের মধ্যে একজন যদিও এখানে আমাদের অবস্থানটা খুব যে সুবিধাজনক সেটা বলবো না কিন্তু অ্যাটলিস্ট গর্ব করার মতো একটা বিষয় আছে তাহলে চিন্তার বিষয় আমাদের কি চিন্তার বিষয় হচ্ছে সেফলি ম্যানেজ অর্থাৎ আর্সেনিক ছাড়া কোনো রকমের জীবাণু দূষণ ছাড়া পানির প্রাপ্যতা যদি আমরা দেখি আমরা পাঁচ বছরে মাত্র টু পার্সেন্টেজ পয়েন্ট আমরা বাড়াতে পেরেছি এবং এই গতিতে গেলে আমরা আসলে আশি শতাংশের বাইরে হয়তো বেয়ন্ডে আমরা এসডিজি কালে যেতে পারবো না এবং ওয়াটার কোয়ালিটিটাকে বিশেষ করে আর্সেনিক এবং ফিকাল কন্টামিনেশনটাকে জোর দিতে হবে আমাদের আগামী দিনে ঠিক একইভাবে আমি যদি দেখি যে পাইপ ওয়াটার সাপ্লাই পাইপ ওয়াটার সাপ্লাইয়ে কেন আমি জোর দিচ্ছি আমরা এই কোভিডের সময়ে যেভাবে হাত ধোয়া দেখাচ্ছি দুই হাত এটা কি টিউবওয়েলের তলে দুই হাত কেউ কোনোদিন এরকম করে ধুতে পারবেন সো আমরা সরকার এবং এনজিওরা মিলে যেটা দেখাচ্ছি আর গ্রামে বা সারা দেশে পনেরো পার্সেন্ট মানুষ পাইপ টোয়াটার পায় দুটো যায় না তো কাজে আমার গ্রাম আমার শহরের মধ্যে আসলে কিছু পরিবর্তন আনতে হবে যাতে গ্রামেও নাগরিক সুবিধা পেতে পারে পাইপ টোয়াটারে আমরা আফগানিস্তানের থেকেও পেছানো আছে এটা কিন্তু খুব লজ্জাস করার একটা বিষয় এরপরে আমরা যদি স্যানিটেশনে দেখি তাহলে আমরা দেখতে পাবো যে মাত্র পঁয়ষট্টি শতাংশ অর্থাৎ এখানেও আমরা মাত্র দুই শতাংশ এগিয়েছি পাঁচ বছরে তো এইটাতে আমাদের একটু আরেকটু বুঝবার আছে সেটা হলো এইটাই আমার মানে লাস্ট স্লাইড হবে এই স্লাইডটাতে আপনি যদি দেখেন এই যে বাম দিকে সবুজ আর লাল দিয়ে আমি যে জিনিসটা দেখিয়েছি সেটা হচ্ছে আমরা প্রায় বলি যে বাংলাদেশে অনেক গ্রামের বাড়িতে দুই ভাই মিলে একটা টয়লেট ব্যবহার করে যৌথ পরিবারে কিংবা শহরে বস্তিতে আট দশ ফ্যামিলি মিলে একটা টয়লেট ব্যবহার করে সেগুলো সহ যদি আমরা একটা উন্নত ল্যাট্রিনের হিসাব করি আসলে শেয়ার ল্যাট্রিন কে বৈশ্বিক ভাবে আসলে উন্নত ল্যাট্রিনের গণনা করা হয় না কিন্তু আমরা তারপরেও যদি জোর করে ধরি তাহলে আমরা দু হাজার পনেরোতে আটষট্টি শতাংশে ছিলাম এখন আমরা পাঁচ বছরে এটা আটাত্তর শতাংশে এসছি কিন্তু শেয়ার ল্যাট্রিনের অনুপাত কিন্তু ক্রমান্বয়ে বেড়ে যাচ্ছে তো এই জায়গাটায় যদি আমরা থাকি আমি আর এই এগুলোর মধ্যে যাচ্ছি না আমি শুধু কারণ প্যানেলিস্ট যারা আছেন তারা আসলে ওয়ে ফরওয়ার্ড এর অনেক কিছুই বলতে পারবেন আমি নির্ধারিত সময়ের মধ্যে শুধু এই দুটা কথা বলতে চাইবো যে 
জলবায়ু পরিবর্তন হাটুরি চেরিয়াতে কি করে দেয়া যায় মানে প্রাইভেট সেক্টরের রোল ইত্যাদি বহু কিছু নিয়ে কথা বলা যাবে কিন্তু আমাদের মূল যে জায়গাটা আসলে সেটা হচ্ছে যে আমাদেরকে আসলে সরকার হচ্ছে সবচেয়ে বড় ডেভেলপমেন্ট প্লেয়ার তার প্রজেক্টের মধ্যে যদি হতদরিদ্রের জন্য প্রকোর স্ট্র্যাটেজিটাকে অ্যাপ্লাই করে যদি আমরা স্যানিটেশনের প্রকল্পগুলো পানির প্রকল্পগুলো কারা অগ্রাধিকার পাবে সেই ভিত্তিতে যদি একটুখানি আমরা প্রণয়ন করার চেষ্টা করি এবং ওই যে আমাদের পররাষ্ট্রমন্ত্রী ভারত সম্পর্কে মন্তব্য করলেন যে ওদের তো বাথরুমই নাই মানে এই নীতি নির্ধারণ মহলে বিষয়টা বুঝতে হবে যে আমরা স্যানিটেশনে অন্যান্য দেশের তুলনায় পিছিয়ে যাচ্ছে আফগানিস্তানের এই সামনে এগিয়ে থাকা এবং অন্যান্যদের তুলনায় পিছিয়ে থাকা আমরা আগে কখনো ছিলাম না সো ওই অহমিকা গৌরব বোধটা স্বাধীনতার পঞ্চাশ বছরের মাথায় এসে যে সেই যে আপনাদেরকে যুদ্ধ বিধ্বস্ত অর্থনীতির চিত্রটা দেখিয়েছিলাম যে এক শতাংশের নিচে থেকে শুরু করেছি আমরা দরিদ্র যুদ্ধ বিধ্বস্ত বাংলাদেশে সেখান থেকে পঞ্চাশ বছরে আমরা এত কিছু করতে পাচ্ছি এই ওয়াটার স্যানিটেশনে কিছু বড় দাগের প্রকল্প এবং দরিদ্রকে দরিদ্র বান্ধব প্রকল্প দরিদ্রকে টার্গেট করে হত দরিদ্রকে আমরা কি করেছি সেই সন্তুষ্টিতে আত্মতৃপ্ত না থেকে আমাদের আরো কি করতে হবে আগামী দশ বছরের মধ্যে ওই জায়গাটায় যদি আমরা একটু বেশি মনোনিবেশ করি আমার মনে হয় যে আমরা এই যে পঞ্চাশ বছরে যেটুকু মিরাকেল এবং গর্বের জায়গা অর্জন করতে পেরেছি সেটা ধরে রাখা এবং সেটাকে আরো এগিয়ে নিয়ে যাওয়ার ব্যাপারে আমরা অনেক ভালো করতে পারবো তো আমি এখানেই আমি শেষ করি আমাদের প্যানেলিস্ট যারা আছেন ওনারা আরো ভালো বলতে পারবেন কি করণীয় এসব বিষয় অনেক ধন্যবাদ আপনাদেরকে আপনাকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ ডক্টর ইসলাম অ্যান্ড আই থিঙ্ক উইথাউট উই হ্যাভ গট আওয়ার কি নট স্পিকার ভেরি রিচ অ্যান্ড ভেরি ইন ডেপ ব্যাকগ্রাউন্ড অফ দ্য হিস্ট্রি অ্যান্ড দ্য প্রোগ্রেস অফ দ্য ওয়াশ সেক্টর ইন বাংলাদেশ প্রি ইন্ডিপেন্ডেন্স অ্যান্ড পোস্ট ইন্ডিপেন্ডেন্স ইট ইস ইন্টারেস্টিং টু সি দ্যাট হাউ মাচ অফ ওয়াট উই হ্যাভ অ্যাচিভড অ্যান্ড ইয়েট হাউ মাচ মোর বাংলাদেশ নিডস টু স্ট্রাইড ফোর্থ টু strike that balance. Um, I would like to go to our panelists at this point. Um, and since I, I don't see any questions at this moment, but uh, let me first introduce uh, the first panelist um, is Nazbun Nahar, Dr. Nazbun Nahar. Uh, she's the Professor of Department of Civil and Engineering, Environmental Engineering, uh, pardon me, North South University. Um, Dr. Um, Nahar will be looking at a very first question, what are the success and challenges in expanding the coverage of hygiene latrines? So um, can I just welcome her to take the floor or the screen, whatever we call it, uh, and start her presentation. Thank you, Saima. Um, so I... Before I start, I'd like to uh, thank Innovation and North South University uh, Economics Department for inviting me as a panelist. I'm really honored uh, to be among the torch bearers of the WASH area in Bangladesh. Today's topic, 50 years of WASH in Bangladesh, and my, uh, like, I'm going to shed some light on um, the success and challenges in expanding the coverage of um, hygiene latrines. I my um, like I will consider my presentation from academic point of view, and I will uh, basically I'm going to use my um, some of the published reports and data to uh, for my presentation today. So I'm not going to do any presentation actually. By the way, I'm just going to talk about it, and uh, we have seen some uh, data as uh, Dr. Khairul Islam showed us. So while discussing the success and um, challenges in the area of hygiene latrine, I would ask myself three questions. Number one is that, where were we? What was our, our past? As we are talking about 50 years of WASH. So uh, what was the past? And then I'm gonna ask my, the second question, where are we today? And then my third question would be, where do we want to go from here? So looking forward. 
So when I think of the past, like where were we? And um, I was like in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we see that uh, as uh, Dr. Kyle Slam mentioned already that uh, open diffraction was one of the major concerns uh, with regard to sanitation. And um, the DPHE, the uh, Department of Public Health Engineering, the NGOs, they uh, took different approaches and they found out that none of those approaches were really successful. And finally, they realized that what they missed was the public awareness. They missed the public mobilization and um, that was absent because they were unable at that point. They didn't actually reach the public to make them understand why it is important to have a, a, like a, you know, a, a latrine, a toilet that is hygienic. So they looked for, uh, for solutions in that regard and actually DPHE, uh, different NGOs, they came up with multi-directional approaches. For example, uh, DPHE uh, introduced, um, say for example, they installed tube wells in different villages. So they said, well, those people or those households who took um, DPHE support in installing the tube wells, they have to have a hygienic latrine. That's uh, in the early nineties, they introduced, they took this approach. So that was one way they kind of uh, reach the public and make them, or I would say that somehow uh, force them to go for hygienic latrine. So they uh, went for another program that Dr. Islam mentioned about the social mobilization for sanitation program. And through this program, uh, the, the, I would say that they significantly engaged the community leaders and community organizations for example, the Union Polisha um, chairman, or yeah, Union Polisha chairman became the uh, head of, of a committee. We call it, they called it, um, I think, uh, yeah, the uh, union level Watson committee, like water and sanitation committee. That was one committee they formed where they also involved the DPHE sub assistant engineer. So it was a collaboration between the uh, local government and it was also the uh, with the collaboration between the local government and the engineering community. So together they um, tried to engage the people. And then there is also another initiative is that they wanted to dedicate a week and later on actually a month, which is a uh, month of October, they call it a sanitation, national sanitation month. So that way another uh, more dedicated and more aggressive campaigning about you know, safe latrine or, you know, uh, safe uh, or hygienic latrine. So this is, these are some of the approaches they, uh, uh, you know, uh, they started or they took. And also the government, uh, they collaborated uh, uh, with the NGOs, uh, national, international NGOs, and um, started awareness programs in Upajala level or sub-district uh, sub level. And um, some of those, when I was looking at the, um, some of the initiatives they took, I found out that some of those initiatives were acceptable because they were more uh, culturally acceptable. For example, they used the method called um, uh, courtyard session, meaning uh, Uthan Adda, I can say that in, in villages, the Uthans is a place where people gather together and they talk and they, you know, uh, so uh, that, that was one uh, method they used and they found it useful or, or successful. They also used um, female outreach workers to reach the female, females of the, uh, or women of the families. And that was also another successful approach because you know that women of the family, they can teach their children about this when they learn about this. Women talk a lot about with other neighboring women and, and they actually, this is how the, method, like the message uh, spread out uh, in the community. So that was another successful uh, approach uh, I, I find. And um, they also used the uh, school teachers. We know that in the villages, the, they have high regard for school teachers. So when they hear something from the school teachers, they accept it. Right. So those are some of the approaches I found that uh, they um, 
the government, DPHE, uh, NGOs there too, to engage people and make the, uh, the importance of uh, you know, uh, hygienic lettering uh, uh, to the people. They took this message to these people. So uh, we also find that uh, work and water aid, they took a program about uh, you know, to try to eradicate the open defection and uh, they started a program called CLTS, Community-Led Total Sanitation. And work was able to demonstrate four villages completely free of op open defection. And uh, that kind of uh, motivated the government to move forward with uh, uh, more policy level uh, changes like national sanitation campaign, et cetera. So in 2003, there was a baseline uh, survey uh, conducted. I just want to mention those uh, data so that it, it will help us to understand when I will discuss the current situation. Because in 2003, in the baseline uh, survey, we found out that only 33% of all the household uh, were using hygiene latrines, where 42% were uh, having the habit of uh, open defection and 25% were using unhygienic latrines. When I say unhygienic latrines, I mean like open hanging latrines, which are uh, posing you know, a health hazard for other people. So starting from 2003 to 2006, as Dr. Islam mentioned, there was like significant improvement. Lots of initiatives were taken during that time, top-down approach, bottom-up approach, and um, rural like monitoring at the sub-district and district level, and also um, many other approaches they took. Taking all these approaches, basically what happened that uh, the open defection rate was coming, uh, you know, it was really getting to a point that we can be proud of as a 50 year uh, celebration. And uh, in one of the approaches they took that the union Polish uh, chairman who achieved 100% coverage uh, were publicly recognized. It was really significant that, you know, at the, at the uh, rural level, when we are recognizing the uh, success of the union level chairman, um, that actually motivated other, uh, 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 you know, the leaders, community leaders. And following the success since 2004, 20% of the annual development program funding were have made uh, available to unions uh, for sanitation purpose. In 2008, the elementary school curriculum included uh, importance of sanitation for third, fourth, and fifth grade students. So the, it was part of the uh, school curriculum. That is another significant improvement. There are uh, several policy level improvements, for example, sector development plan, policy uh, pro poor strategy plan, uh, national strategy for sanitation uh, in hard to reach uh, areas for Bangladesh 2012, those uh, documentations or those uh, policy uh, documents actually supported uh, planning at different levels. In 2015, Bangladesh government issued a circular uh, for school sanitation that instructs the school with the uh, menstrual uh, hygiene uh, needs for school going girls. That is a significant improvement. Now uh, with that, I'd like to, um, you know, go into the present situation. Uh, I will request you to give me, like, tell me how much time do I have? I have left. So, Emma? Oh, sorry, oh, you don't have much time, uh, Doctor. Okay. Uh, uh, no, but yes, please go on if you can take one or two minutes. Okay, and sure. I, I will be finishing in one or two minutes. Yeah. For the audience as well, uh, if you can put your questions in the chat box. Um, we can address them after Dr. Nahar finishes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so when I say that what is the current situation, we are saying that today the the like the open defection rate as per uh, the GM JMP, which is the Joint Monitoring uh, Program by WHO and uh, UNICEF, that their uh, 2019 data is saying that right now the open defection rate is one percent. So that's where we are today. So that's a significant improvement. Now, way forward or moving forward, what are the current challenges? One of the major challenges that I think is the quality of the latrines. We are talking about access to latrine, but 
what about the quality? So I think it is time that we need to look into the quality of the latrines, meaning the cleanliness of the latrines. Whether it's an urban area or a rural area, we all know that uh, you know, our, our latrines are not of uh, the quality that we expect. And there was a 2014 uh, survey, and it found out that only 34% household latrines were both improved and clean. That was the rate. So we need to work on that. So operation and maintenance of uh, latrines like public toilets, we also, we need to work on that. So I think a new type of campaign needs to start. For example, we can say, my latrine smells good, something like that, you know, uh, like a campaign can like start like that. City corporation should focus on public toilets. They also should uh, focus on women-friendly public toilets. Also, another thing is that the physically challenged people, we need uh, public uh, latrines or wherever it is, urban or rural, uh, that are accessible for disabled-friendly people. Uh, school sanitation must be improved. And also, we need to have uh, improved, um, uh, or I'd say, the technology for latrine, considering areas, for example, chore area, hour area, or even slum areas in the urban uh, setup. So as uh, uh, my last comment would be, we need to make it a national uh, goal to, have, uh, to set up a goal for public health. And we say that, okay, in order to uh, achieve the SDG uh, goal number six, we need to set up these as a high priority and uh, concerted effort from all different uh, departments like Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Water Resources. With all our concerted effort, we can achieve more success in the coming days. Thank you, Saima. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Naha. That was really, really good. Uh, we got quite a vast, um, you know, um, analysis of what has been the challenges and how far we have come. Challenges are quite a lot, although there has been a lot of, like you said, targeted approach to how we can rectify and remedy some of the situations. Are there any questions from the floor um, to ask Dr. Naha? I don't see any in the chat box. No? Right, we've got one question. Do we need dedicated strategy for piped water supply scheme systems to ensure progress expected for SDG 6.1 in safety managed water services? Dr. Naha, can you see the question? It's from Samidul Islam Water Aid. So the question is, do we need a dedicated strategy for piped water supply scheme and systems? The question for me? Yeah. It's here. So if you are comfortable answering this, you can. Otherwise, we can later on take it in our question and answer session. I think is that, that uh, as Dr. Islam also mentioned about the pipe, especially in the uh, uh, post-COVID situation, we do need to have a brainstorming and we need to find out how, uh, what kind of strategy we need to come up with in order to uh, look into the pipe water supply condition. Uh, I, from my research, I also find out that the pipe water quality uh, is a major issue even nowadays in, in, in the rural area, in, in the urban areas. So yeah, I would say yes, we need to. One of the other questions that we got from uh, Mahir Abdullah, how academic leaders connect government in campaign? I think the, the question actually targeted the bridging between academia and the policymakers. How do we do that? I, I think if uh, the question is uh, to me, I would say that uh, when the different committees are formed, the academias, uh, academicians should be invited there. and. The similarly, when uh, academicians, as academicians, we work in different research projects, we can also actually involve the government institutes or the heads of like Water Development Board or WASA, and uh, so that in collaboration, we can come up with uh, different strategies and uh, yeah, solutions. Thank you very much, Dr. Nara. Thank you for your time you. and your uh, very, very rich discussion. Can I move on to our uh, next panelist? Um, and we have Dr. Mohammad Mafizur Rahman, Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, BUET. 
And the area that Dr. Rahman will be looking at is what are the success in engaging local government actors of um, fecal sludge management. Dr. Rahman, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Saima. Uh, I would like to convey thanks to Innovation and the Department of Economics, North South University, <clears throat> uh, for inviting me to as panelist um, in today's webinar. May I request uh, uh, permission to share the screen? Yeah. Can you uh, find anything on the screen? I shared something. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, uh, Dr. Khairul uh, mentioned a number of issues that we have been going through since our independence in terms of uh, uh, wash. Uh, here, I like to highlight mostly on the fecal sludge part. Uh, as you can see, these are the basic components of fecal sludge. The reason fecal sludge comes uh, into play is, uh, you know, initially it was assumed that only taking care of water supply and quality of water supply can ensure good supply of water, but uh, it was understood that without paying attention to sanitation and hygiene, uh, only pure water supply can't be ensured. So uh, sanitation and uh, management of sludge is very important, especially in the context of wash, it's fecal sludge, which is very important. And uh, we, had, uh, we already had a number of statistics in terms of uh, open defecation, from uh, panelists, Dr. Najmun and uh, Dr. Khairul. Uh, but I'd like to highlight how and what are the areas, how the local government uh, put initiative on this fecal sludge management. As you can see uh, in this slide, uh, there are a, a number of documents. I just uh, put the title of those documents, which are the institutional regulatory framework for fecal sludge management. As, and you can see these uh, documents uh, are uh, separate for city corporations, Poro Shabhas, uh, rural areas. And of course, there is one document for mega city Dhaka because of the enormous size of Dhaka compared to the other city corporations. And the smaller ones belong to the Poro Shabhas and Poro Shabha areas also have issues relating to fecal, sl fecal sludge uh, management and the rural areas in the context of Bangladesh are quite different. Uh, there is a distinct difference between the lifestyle and living style between the rural and urban areas. So these institutional regulatory frameworks were uh, made for fecal sludge management uh, around 2017. Actually, this uh, initiative uh, specifically on fecal sludge management in uh, Bangladesh uh, emphatically started from uh, 2014. And since then, uh, it took some time to formulate these documents. And in the context of Bangladesh, as you have already found from uh, Dr. Khairul's presentation, uh, we had a lot of successes, but we had also shortcomings. And uh, fecal sludge uh, management happens to be one of the areas which were addressed very late. And you definitely understand that uh, the issue of fecal sludge came because uh, later, because we already had a huge uh, number of open defecation uh, practices. And uh, then the national action plan uh, also came for the urban and rural areas very separately. And you can see that the uh, context for rural areas uh, is uh, confined in one national action plan. And uh, the context of urban areas are separated into city corporation and and as you can see, these documents came uh, visible in uh, 20, so 2020. So it's not uh, long ago that we had uh, these sort of documents. And uh, this is the fecal sludge management FSM network for different types of areas in Bangladesh. So the structure is very different, as I mentioned, for urban and rural areas and uh, the Poroshava city corporations, mega cities, of course, fall uh, in this group of urban uh, type. And this is the organogram for different committees that would help the implementation of regulatory framework that I have already shown for different components. This is the FSM IRF for the rural area. So uh, as I mentioned that the context of uh, urban and rural are so different. So rural areas are uh, operated mostly by these uh, Union Purishad and Union Purishad uh, in con conjunction with Upojela Purishad, they work together and uh, they have that 
ward level committee. So these are uh, very nice and appropriate initiatives. Even the lake, you can see that uh, on top of this organogram, it's the local government division of Ministry of LGRD and uh, C, that, uh, that is the ministry. And uh, this is the organogram for the urban areas and for the city corporation. So the context of cities are quite complicated. And as you see, this is for uh, specifically for Dhaka, where we have North and South City Corporation. And as you understand, these are all under the Ministry of Local Government. So uh, they have a huge role to play uh, in it. And uh, the Department of Public Health Engineering, uh, Local Government and Engineering Department, LGD, uh, WASA, we have Dhaka Wasa, Chittagong Wasa, Khulna Wasa. Then all these Wasas are also under the local government, uh, Ministry of Local Government. And uh, in that framework, we already listed the, the participating institutions. And uh, this slide will possibly answer some of the questions we, I, I, which I just found in the uh, question in the chat box. Some of the uh, audiences were interested about how the academia could contribute in such uh, Initiative. So you can see uh, it lists the participating institutions, and it has the uh, it has the ministries, it has the local government institutions. As I mentioned, the Poro Shavas, the uh, DPHE, and LGD in the supporting role. We have institutions uh, participating in capacity building. So you see, uh, we find the education institutions and opportunity or potential for other institutions to contribute in this whole uh, initiative. And we have uh, institutions participating in awareness building. And we have that uh, NGOs participating here uh, in, on top of the ministries and urban forum and other development partners. We have, uh, Karel Bhai mentioned that we have a lot of uh, contribution from the development partners as well. And uh, uh, these uh, national action plans already lists all these issues in both in urban and rural context. Do I have time, uh, Saima? Uh, do I have some more time or is it free? Okay. Yes, you can take a few, I think one or two minutes. Okay. So uh, then uh, institutional roles and responsibilities. Uh, I just show you the slide where it uh, shows how the overall responsibility of eco sludge management is uh, given on the shoulder of different agencies and what are the specific activities they carry on. So this, these slides are prepared based on the uh, rural context, but it at least shows that uh, the Upojala Purishad, how they structured all the issues, how they addressed all the issues. Uh, uh, and this was possible because of involvement of local government, Ministry of Local Government, because their network is very strong and one of their major mandates is uh, sanitation on top of water supply. So you can see the specific activities and how those were uh, documented in the uh, uh, framework. Uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, for the rural areas. Uh, for example, uh, they can uh, engage the private sector and NGOs for monitoring the peat emptying and fecal sludge disposal practices. So such monitoring is included and it is in the uh, under the title disposal of fecal sludge and uh, they can carry out inspection and make sure that fecal uh, matters are not stored on street or open place and are not discharged in the drain, canal or sewer. So uh, these are the examples uh, through which I wanted to highlight very uh, micro issues how uh, even in the rural area, in the rural context of Bangladesh, the Union Purishat could take care or can take care of uh, these uh, fecal sludge management issues. And I would say, even though it's, uh, we can say it's late, but still the document is there and it's been taken care of by the lead ministry, which is the local government, Ministry of Local Government. And uh, it, it, I would say the document is very strong and there is huge uh, potential how this uh, fecal sludge management issues could be addressed under this ministry. So I would not like to take extra time and yeah. Thank you very much. I'd like to hand it over to you, Saima. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Rahman, uh, for your uh, presentation. We do have uh, one question 
specifically for you. And there are really some good questions coming in. Thank you, everyone, for those of you contributing. Um, for you, the question is from Ahmad Ali Mia. Um, he mentioned that fecal sludge management is a very minor scale through INGO NGOs with col collaboration with the utility department. Is it possible to undertake by the government mainstreaming responsibilities? So basically, yeah. it's kind of uh, like sidelined. Yeah, of course, into. of course, it is possible uh, by the government uh, mainstreaming uh, agencies, and they will. But uh, you know, the history of fecal sludge management in the context of Bangladesh is not so old. As I mentioned, it's only 2014 when it started, and uh, in the meantime, we have already spent 50 years. And you have seen the statistics in terms of uh, water supply, pipe to water supply, and other sanitation statistics. So. Fecal sludge uh, getting on board in 2014 definitely will pick up in the coming decade, I assume. And I, I, I believe I want to believe that government uh, agencies will be taking main, main responsibilities, of course, in association with the NGOs and international donors. And yeah, as I mentioned, the academia is already there in the document. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rahman. We are going to have another question and answer round after all three of our panel members have spoken in the first session. So um, I would like to quickly move thank on you. and welcome one, the next uh, panel member and thanking Dr. Rahman for his presentation. Yeah, so the next panelist is uh, Takiv Nain Khan. Um, he's the project manager, Sunmarks 2, funded by UNICEF and SDC, implemented by IPE Bangladesh. And he will be looking at what are the notable engagement from the private sector on WASH. So over to you, Mr. Khan. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, can you allow me to share my screen? Right. So um, while this is, this is being set up, a lot of you are commenting and contributing. Please continue to do so. And we will pick it up at the end of this uh, first session. Thank you. Yes, we can see the screen. All right. I hope it's in presentation mode. Um, OK. So thank you so much again. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak uh, in, uh, in this session. I'm really honored to have all kinds of watch practitioners, academicians participate. And I think the last three sessions uh, really set up what I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, as we saw in the first session, there's been uh, developments, there's been things that have happened uh, in the sector. Uh, and, you know, there has been relative progress uh, that we have seen. I particularly come from a generation which saw, you know, there are all kinds of wash related challenges and coming to a point that we have resolved some of them and there's this path to uh, come towards in the future. So as we saw in the previous three sessions, uh, you know, there's a discussion with government stakeholders, development agencies coming in and doing all kinds of great work in WASH and you know, their efforts show you know, how well the progress is in recent years. Uh, in recent times, what we have seen is uh, some project designs, duration, budget allocations, and the scope often limit adoption. So you know, that is a challenge and you know, that really restricts certain kinds of efforts in WASH. So what we see there is that private sector in recent years have shown that scope, that there's something that they can do to complement that support that the government development agencies praise. So in this session, I'll basically talk about two efforts that I've seen and I'm uh, particularly related in my day-to-day -day project management uh, in the project that I manage right now. And there are two others that we came across publicly that's available that shows you know, how uh, this can benefit the sector. The first one I'll talk about is product. And there was a nice session uh, a few, uh, few sessions back which talked about the product and you know, if the product is not a good product, households can actually benefit from it. Uh, so I want to show you uh, this product, which is called the Sato Pen. It is developed by Lexil, which is a Japanese company that took over American Standard. And they started making this product and it's a very inexpensive, affordable product that has a water, a water trap, trap door uh, that blocks odors, insects, and allows households to benefit from using an, a latrine product and to call it, be potentially called an improved product that can benefit their lives. And they started doing this particularly for bottom of the pyramid markets. They're in 14 countries of the world, either directly or through a local representative. Uh, in Bangladesh, they've partnered with different development agencies and different uh, organizations have taken their products, placed it in rural communities as well. In Bangladesh, particularly, 
for continuing the production efforts. Uh, they work with RFL, uh, and you know this is produced in regular basis, and they have contributed in evolving the product so uh, fecal matter is disposed of safely. The second area that I want to talk about is uh, distribution. So in distribution, I want to show you this company which is called RFL, uh, which you're very familiar with. They produce all kinds of different products and have an advantage in plastic product particularly. Uh, they partner with Satopen and, you know, they, so with the Lixil company and, you know, they produce Satopen and their distribution network is what takes it to the last mile communities. Uh, so they've been working also uh, in uh, do, doing the correct kind of production, in limiting the price, in resolving any issues related to supply chain. And they're also a partner for the project that we are we're managing as well right now uh, for Sandmarks too, for making improved sanitation that means available to last mile communities. Uh, so this is kind of another example where they have been actively mobilizing sales staff to ensure that in addition to other products, this is also a part of their dealership and this product, which they also see that there's an impact associated with this. When communities use this, uh, they benefit from improved like means. So they basically take their effort to make this available in last mile communities. I'll go to the third area, which is, uh, you know, examples I came across. There were so many others. And, you know, it's 50 years. Uh, I wanted to focus more on recent uh, examples of private sector engagement in the wash. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is Unilever Bangladesh. Uh, I came across their campaign, which was done a few years back. Uh, in school to teach children about the importance of hand washing, soap usage, uh, you know, as a, as a means to prevent communicable diseases from uh, taking place. Uh, so it's interesting uh, that they, you know, they have done this uh, with a particular product, a commercial product that is there, that they're marketing. And they're doing something very similar to what many in using wash are doing. They go to schools, they target children, you know, so that they learn about improved hygiene practices and are passing this uh, information to the households, to their family members as well. Uh, so it, it shows how, you know, WASH efforts, development led agency efforts are, it can be replicated by private sector and they can also bring in their years of experience to make it even better. Uh, another example I came across, it was through PKSF and it's uh, microfinance partners is the output based data or the very results driven sanitation loans that are provided where once it is actually uh, installed, you know, the any loan clearances are conducted to avoid any misuse of uh, loans being made. So this is an interesting example as well, because in the market, you will always have people who will not have the means to purchase upfront and they will not be able to procure from regular conventional markets directly. So there will be a population like that and the whole scope to be allowed some kind of means of financing really removes uh, financing as a barrier to purchasing these improved products. Uh, I, I didn't bring any water examples in particular. There are uh, uh, people from uh, water backgrounds who will present later on. I didn't bring any. But as I complete or come to the end of this uh, discussion, uh, I want to talk about considerations for the private sector in WASH. Uh, while this is great, you know, they've started doing this, there is a place and private sector can create, provide that extra mileage uh, for uh, you know development agencies working in WASH. There's some considerations that need to be made the first one being to complement the development approach. There are certain approach efforts that development agencies provide. Uh, it's essential to merge that with the interest of a private sector. It might be a little different to how a project uh, tries to reach its targets versus how a private sector would want to do it. Uh, but however, uh, there was a session discussion on, you know, talking about uh, yard sessions, which is a very effective tool. Many NGOs have done that. And uh, even we use it in our project as well and how it could be tweaked actually so a private sector could utilize that in their regular day-to-day -day marketing activities the second is on uh, private sector distribution network the distribution network is very strong and at times they have the potential uh, to replicate what many NGOs can do with their workers with the health workers in last mile communities this is also to some extent possible if the profit motive and the interest is there for them uh, this is another area to consider. The approach to marketing is very important. Private sector often uh, tries to provide the product information and the price first. Uh, however, if there is information provided related to the benefit, the real message, uh, wash related, if it's hygiene related, water related, or sanitation related, and then products are introduced, it might be even better. Uh, connecting larger private sector with micro entrepreneurs, we have seen in various uh, field experiences that micro entrepreneurs often don't know or have the means to connect to the dealerships that are there. So there might be something for them to do if there's a business case, of course, for them. 
the need to evolve with purchasing power is an important factor as well. Uh, I've shown a product earlier, and this is a product which makes sense in rural markets. It is something, you know, it's affordable. They don't have running water. So, you know, a, a pan which is made out of plastic is very useful for them. But there are, we have seen uh, cases where people have greater aspirations. They want to move up. They want to purchase better looking things, which they associate with a better brand value, like a ceramic uh, latrine. So this is also an area for private sector to consider, to continuously evolve their products, to have that option to cater to different market segments. Uh, there might be some barriers as well that might uh, they might face, uh, and it is nothing to actually uh, get discouraged about. It is It will be there and how it should be handled is important. Uh, wash related products uh, have a different priority. People in rural markets prioritize food, shelter. These are the first things they will prioritize. So once you have a latrine or like a hand washing device, it is something that comes later on. So it's important how they would be educated or how it would hit in their minds that they need this product and they need to invest in it uh, as it uh, reduces a lot of health savings costs, uh, you know, uh, and any absenteeism if the children are not being able to go to school because of any diseases occurring to them. Uh, finally, they might come into places where the government is doing wonderful work uh, allocating uh, latrines for marginalized communities who might never be able to purchase these. So they might not uh, feel discouraged to, you know, be in that market, but they need to find out ways to get it to other markets that are there, other people who might need their products and might purchase it from the conventional markets. So with that, uh, I hope, you know, uh, you had a chance to see, you know, how private sector is contributing in the sector. I will hand it over. Uh, you know, that is the end of my presentation. I look forward to your comments, suggestions, questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Khan, uh, for your presentation. With this, we come to the first um, end of the first session, end of the first session. And we really are getting very good questions um, for this uh, session. I'm going to keep um, uh, requesting you to write them at the chat box. And if the panel members could kindly address them, if you see them, if you think that that's relevant to you, you can already answer them because we got quite a few and I'm concerned of the time that we may not be able to go through all of them, but these are really, really good ones. So because of uh, the long list of questions, can we just have um, a few minutes? I would say five minutes we'll have for question and answer. Um, so some of the questions are really, really good. So if I can start with, with the uh, first uh, panel members. So one of the things that come up is, is very, very important is Bangladesh, um, it's from Ayatollah. Um, so one of the things that he, he's been talking about is the community-based approach. Um, how we can actually ensure the sustainable community approach to O&M uh, in a rural setup, given that although we have a city structure and most of the country is uh, rural and semi-rural areas, so how this can be done? Very briefly, if Dr. Nahar, you have unmuted yourself, if you could address that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Saima. Actually, uh, in terms of O&M, is that uh, that we need to empower the local population. So we need to train up local people, but at the same time, we need to uh, do annual or biannual inspection because uh, when we train up someone, we need to go back there and see that if it is working properly or the trained people, whether they're giving the service properly. And when we engage someone uh, to or, or train people to do the ONM work, we, they need to be... Uh, given some sort of incentive. So I think it should be under the union position, like the lowest level of uh, the administrative framework we have there, administrative unit we have there, they should be empowered to have a certain uh, when um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, people there so to take care of that. So it, it needs to be within the administrative framework, this ONM thing. I mean, what we see from engineering point of view that we install things or we build things, but we don't do any, like we don't leave a ONM manual there. We just set up the things there and we leave. We engineers, we leave that place. So I would say that when we build something, we set up something, we also need to develop an ONM manual and then train some people to follow that. And we also have a inspection uh, in that, uh, like the, uh, uh, in that process so that we do uh, inspect that, uh, that it has been done properly. 
I guess Absolutely. I answered monitoring. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I think I think monitoring is very, very important and part of the policy process and delivery uh, initiatives that if we want to have an all-rounded aspect of it, we definitely need some monitoring and feedback. Thank you for that. The next question, I think Dr. Rahman can answer this, is um, FSM is a good solution. Uh, it's from Farah Jahan Chaudhry. She's saying that FSM may contribute to groundwater pollution if there is a fault in the design. What is your suggestion in terms of design? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, engineers are very much aware of the possible mistakes or errors that might rise from the design stage. So. Uh, I think uh, some body for quality assurance is very important. And uh, the entities manufacturing or designing the products and uh, the entities uh, monitoring the quality should be different. And uh, that could be a very uh, reasonable way to ensure safety, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from uh, Partho as uh, Kuntal. I think uh, Mr. Islam, Dr. Islam can um, answer that. So GOB has reduced the budget for WASH uh, for the financial year 2021-22, whereas we need per capita uh, 11,000 taka allocation, uh, I think. Is that, is that per capita? Yeah, allocation. How can we convince or influence government to focus more on this issue? It's uh, about uh, core budgetary, I think, uh, yeah. allocation. Th thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, uh, I think uh, Hosanjil Rahman will be making the closing remarks, and he has been actually examining the trend of budgetary allocation and expenditure for the last number of years. So I would better park this question for him uh, to respond, okay. but Fine. but quickly speaking, I would say that a very nuanced analysis of the whole thing is necessary. That where it is needed most, and which area, which population group, and those kind of things. But I mean, Professor, I mean, Dr. Hosenjilu Rahman would be best person to respond to this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so there is one uh, question regarding the uh, the monetary uh, side of it like how do we include the extreme poor into uh, the area of uh, um, an inclusion into this uh, process is there will there be any incentives for them or whether there could be some incentives lined up uh, for the extreme poor i think three people has asked something related to that can I, can I take this question? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, there is a strategy, I mean, approved by the government, prepared and approved by the government, which is called Pro-Poor Strategy for Water Sanitation and Hygiene. Mm -hmm. And there they have outlined some of the mechanism how the extreme poor and lowest to income clientele people could be supported in water and sanitation and also in hygiene. Like, I mean, you might have seen during COVID time, there were, I mean, certain direct transfer. Uh, we have experienced that through the local government institution, especially in the rural areas, uh, sanitation support has been extended. So uh, I think uh, Professor Najmun Nahar has mentioned number of times about the quality of the infrastructure that every year the amount of resources poor people spend on this structure, it is high time to look into those. The graphs that I have shown that how India, Pakistan, and Nepal have improved their sanitation condition, because Jeta Huetse, the Goto Pashat Bachore E Kwaita Desh, Doridro Manush Der Pechone sanitation, a Prochur Koroch Koroch, a Prochur Binyo Koroch, a Bong Jono Shaste Binyo Kora. This is the জন্য ভালো যেটা সুফল তারা এখন পাচ্ছে এই কোভিডের সময়ে পাচ্ছে ওয়াটার কোয়ালিটিতে পাচ্ছে কাজে সবকিছু মিলিয়ে যেটা বলবো যে যখনই আমাদের ওয়াটার স্যানিটেশনের প্রকল্পগুলো হবে স্থানীয় সরকার প্রতিষ্ঠানগুলো বিশেষ করে যেন ইউনিয়ন পরিষদ এবং এই যে আমাদের শহরে পৌরসভাগুলো এবং সেখানে যারা ওয়ার্ড কাউন্সিলর আছেন ওনারা যুক্ত থাকার সুযোগ পান এবং সরকারের এখন Digital mechanism even Nana Habe Duridra Jono Gostike, reach correct to Kitsu Shock Komotesche, which is Shimabodoto Hatu Taktepare, 
কিন্তু ওই যে প্রপুর স্ট্র্যাটেজির আলোকে যদি এই এই যে পরে ডিপিএইচই এখন যে প্রকল্পগুলো নিতে যাচ্ছে এগুলো যদি নিতে পারে এবং টার্গেটিংটা যদি ভালোভাবে হয় তাহলে ডেফিনেটলি এক্সট্রিম পুয়োররা অনেক বেনিফিটেড হবে আই উইল এমফাসাইজ অন দি প্রপুর স্ট্র্যাটেজি ইমপ্লিমেন্টেশন থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ ভেরি মাচ পলিসি উইথ অ্যালং উইথ দ্য পলিসি देयर शुड बी इंप्लीमेंटेशन एंड स्ट्रांग इंप्लीमेंटेशन गाइडलाइंस and practices thank you very much uh, i am very conscious of time um so i will take the other questions in the uh, next um part of the session please do keep uh putting them on the chat box can i uh with uh, with your permission uh everyone can i just swiftly move on to our next panel session and this panel session we also have three more uh speakers and this is we are calling it the second round uh, and the structure is pretty much the same as the first one uh, we will be welcoming our first uh, three speakers and as we go along we'll be answering questions um later so for the first uh, speaker may i um, invite mr rumat ashraf regional director middle east and latin america habitat co and he will be sort of focusing what are the challenges in marketing hygiene products to the bop thank you saima uh, please give me a moment to share my screen absolutely um so what while you are doing that oh that's it's up there good uh, is we it are all ready yes okay so uh hello everyone uh good afternoon this is rumat ashraf from hepco first of all uh i would like to thank innovation uh water aid nsu and everyone uh, uh who who actually worked hard to arrange such a great discussion session today so uh today i'll be talking about the challenges uh in marketing hygiene products to the bop so from our perspective uh the challenges that come with uh, marketing hygiene products in the bop market are not with the household consumers themselves it is rather with the actors uh who build the system for hygiene services for the bop consumers so firstly i want to say that uh, our focus is on hand washing when we talk about hygiene products for the bop uh, not only because it is cost effect, uh, efficient in the long run uh, but also because uh, it is the recommended hygiene method by all the uh, global uh, authorities that are working with health so the challenges we we encounter when marketing hand washing with soap not any product but just hand washing is that most people who market hand, uh, hand washing to the bop consumers uh, focus on behavior change campaigns raising awareness we are not against that but we don't raising awareness or telling people to wash their hands be more powerful uh, when people are enabled to wash their hands or if i put it very simply we tell people to wash their hands but how can they do that when they don't have a place to do that so given the focus on posters and uh, public service announcements there are two chal- two things that that come into my mind first of all this is a challenge for us because by itself the communication itself doesn't lead to more hand washing by people because people cannot use posters to wash their hands right and secondly uh, how do we make sure that there is awareness and essentially there is access when uh, i said uh, the challenge in marketing hygiene products is uh, is more at a systemic level this is one part of what i mean we know from research that uh, the best opportunity to increase hand washing is 
uh, if BOP consumers have access to hand washing facilities. But the reality is that hand washing is not easy to do. When uh, you are a student or a rural clinic patient in Bangladesh, our sector's focus in designing hand washing facilities has uh, rightly been uh, been on hand washing right after bathroom uses and uh, before food preparation. That was genius, undoubtedly. But we haven't updated our thinking in a long, long time. Public health guidance now says, wash your hands more often in more places and hand washing should be your first choice. And uh, in this pandemic situation, this is more viable. But we haven't set up hand washing th that way, not yet. So you might be wondering, Rumat, why is this a challenge? Let me answer, answer this question for you. Uh, setting hand washing up only in the bathroom matters, definitely matters. Because like many important things, we do them when it is easy to do. Research shows uh, that, that most people only wash their hands when the sink is easily within reach. This research I'm talking about uh, was done by Canadian nurses, uh, done on Canadian nurses, uh, and they are supposed to be the best at hand washing, right? But most things today are not within reach. Fair enough. Uh, it just means that if we want more hand washing, hand washing needs to be very, very easy to do. So. The question now is, how do we overcome this challenge where people don't have any hand washing within reach? Well, it might sound a little bit too simple, but the solution is also simple. We, we put hand washing within reach. We are in a new normal for so many things in this pandemic. Let's build a new normal for hand hygiene also. And Sorry. Okay. One in which we, we wash our hands uh, in more places at more times, mm, but this requires a shift, a shift in how we manage hand washing uh, facilities. So what kind of shift uh, in hand washing facilities are we talking about? We are talking about a shift towards uh, easy to use facilities that basically knows the kind of behavior change we promote through posters and campaigns. It means new things like having things that are socially distanced and things that are at the right height for everyone to wash their hands without any help. So that is a simple solution. So the next big question is how? Uh, again, another how question. Uh, how do we do this? We do it with next generation of things. We have to design the next generation of things to be modular, durable, and uh, most importantly, portable. So that teachers and the students can set, up, set it up and maintain themselves very easily so that uh, uh, schools and clinics management uh, can jump straight to the desired outcome, which is people washing their hands when and where needed. That is why we exist and uh, we want to make this a vision of, of a new normal of hand, hand hygiene uh, a reality. We, we, we think this is very possible uh, and, and we want to get it done, ideally before the next pandemic. We have achieved a lot, a lot in, in last 50 years, more than a lot of countries I, I, I can compare to in this world. And I'm, I'm so sure that the hygiene challenges that are in front of us uh, in, uh, in Bangladesh, we can overcome this very, very soon. So that was, that was my part. And if there is any question, I would uh, love to answer that. Thank you. Over to you, Saima. Thank you very much, Mr. Ashraf. I think that, is, that was really, really good, especially during the post-pandemic era, as we move forward, uh, there has to be uh, some uh, structural changes and 
uh, new ways of place making and place shaping. Um, thank you for that. I'm just um, conscious of time. So in that case, can we first take all the panelists and then go to the question and answer, if that's all right? Sure. So I think that would be more way of accommodating questions and answers. Thank you very much. And can we invite um, our next speaker? So um, our next speaker is Minhad Chaudhry from uh, Drink Well. And can I have, sorry, I've lost. Hi, Simon, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Sorry, I've just lost my slide where, where it says what you will be focusing on, but I guess you can pick it from there. I'm guessing that it will be focused on uh, this, this uh, the overall aspect of what we are looking at, the history of wash in uh, post-independence 50 years of Bangladesh. So can I just welcome you quickly uh, to do your presentation? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Saima. So um, I'll take that as my cue to... I think start the, the the session with a provocative statement. And you know, the question posed to me was um, the challenges and successes around reaching um, the hard to reach people when it comes to safe water. And uh, in in my eleven years of experience, um, I would like to start by saying that free water is the most expensive water. And so, what I mean by that is, you know. Uh, uh, so I was originally born in Dallas, in, in, in Texas, where I'm actually today. Um, and my parents are Bangladeshi American. And so, uh, sorry, my parents are Bangladeshi, I'm Bangladeshi American. And so coming to Bangladesh uh, every summer was um, uh, an eye-opening experience where I saw the differences between uh, piped water in the U.S. versus tube well water in rural Bangladesh. And so um, in 2004, I met with a professor, Dr. Rup Singh Gupta from Lehigh University, who invented a resin that can remove arsenic from groundwater. And that's actually one of the largest mass poisonings in human history, according to the World Health Organization in Bangladesh, as well as in Eastern India. And so I studied public health. And in 2012, um, I met Dr. Singh Gupta as part of a Fulbright program. And we started uh, talking about why safe water continues to elude the low-income populations, particularly in Bangladesh, in India, et cetera. And we agreed that it wasn't so much a technology problem as much as it was a management model problem. And so, um, you know, Drinkwell, which is the company that I founded uh, along with Dr. Singupta and Mike, who's his PhD student in the center photo, um, we're effectively a company that's trying to um, eradicate the water crisis through technology, yes, but what we quickly realized is um, it's not an issue of just the uh, purification technology, it's the service delivery modality itself. And so um, uh, over the past uh, uh, eight years, we've basically worked with about 41 partners. Uh, we've deployed about 540 systems ranging from a domestic filter to piped water schemes that are 93 meters cubed per hour. And uh, what we've found is that um, there's very different operating models that really dictate how you can really reach the poorest of the poor. And I think, you know, and I, I'll speak to our Bangladesh experience today. And um, the model that followed was first, we received some seed funding from USAID. And then we worked with the Department of Public Health Engineering in Bangladesh. And then we started to work directly with WASAs, uh, initially Dhaka WASA in 2017, and then Chattagram WASA last year. And what we first found, uh, I'll take you to Dhaka first, uh, is in 2017, there are 700 water uh, pump houses that WASA has. And water is supposed to be free at these uh, pump houses for the 4 million low-income floaters who come to collect water. However, the reality was that you had a lot of water sharks kind of illegally occupy these pumps and jerry-rig lines to sell water of inconsistent prices, of inconsistent quality, and inconsistent times. And so we partnered with WASA to actually kind of professionalize the system and see if there was a way we could actually officially and legally set up a way for these low-income floaters to actually collect water from these ATM booths. And so um, that's eff effectively the start of how I realized that, yes, the water is in theory free, 
but it's actually expensive because people are actually either on the supply side taking advantage of a situation or on the demand side finding that neglect of the water infrastructure is so high that they're having to do additional purification or resort to other sources of water to meet their needs. And so um, the public-private partnership model we did with WASA was where we would provide the filtration technology, the water ATM at no cost to WASA. And in exchange, we would want WASA to allow us to operate on their premises. And so uh, they set the tariff at 40 bushel per liter. And we work with them to set the timing of the ATM booth to agree on water quality parameters. And then we also use different kinds of technologies to ensure minimal system loss. And basically um, we have a four stage operating model. Uh, what we basically do is first we'll test the water. So arsenic is very prone in rural areas. In Taka, not so much, it's more iron. Same thing in Jinagong, you have higher iron and uh, salinity in parts of Kulna. And once we understand the baseline, we'll do a public private partnership contract directly with the government agency. Um, and then we'll build the system. It'll be anywhere from uh, three meters cube to a, uh, we've done six large pipe water schemes in West Bengal. And then we'll lean on the government entity to really set the tariff, which is extremely important um, just to ensure equity. And then once the tariff is set by the government agency, we will do the operation maintenance ourselves. And what's critical is we don't expect the maintenance and operation costs to be recovered through just the tariffs. So we do expect some subsidy from the government uh, because tariff is naturally the biggest question when it comes to equity and really accessing the um, poorest of the poor and helping them afford safe water. So um, if I just give you kind of a three-year snapshot, um, we've basically grown around 5X around our deployments a little over 540 systems serving 18 and a half million liters per month, uh, 6.4 lakh people covered. But what I'm most proud of is that I, we've created 330 local jobs. And as the previous panelists mentioned, I think when it comes to O&M, local job creation is of utmost importance. And you know we have around 20% of our ATM booth operators as females. And I think that's really critical to ensure proper community sensitization of what a water ATM is and ensuring that you have proper um, buy-in from the local community. Now, um, I think what COVID-19 brought about is more involvement of the larger companies to engage in WASH. So um, Happy Tap, who spoke before me, had a uh, hand washing station and we actually partnered with them and deployed these hand washing stations across the ATM booths uh, around March and April of last year. And then as it was clear that the COVID uh, variant was evolving into the Delta variant, we deployed 250 hand washing stations at no cost to the end users across Dhaka in partnership with Dhaka Wasa and Unilever. And I think um, as we think about, you know, there were questions about lowering budget priorities fiscally from the government when it comes to wash. Clearly there seems to be a mandate and I think a business case for a Unilever Bangladesh to promote Lifebuoy by subsidizing the cost of these hand washing stations, which typically go defunct. But in our case, we have a 24 month contract with Takawasa, with Lifebuoy to ensure that if the pump stops working, if the water runs out, if the soap runs out, it's properly um, refilled. And the business case for that is you're actually entering the mindset of these low income customers. And as their incomes improve, hopefully you can get more of their mind share and get them to finally afford other products. But coming back to the crux of the question, I think you know, when it comes to free water being the most expensive water, I think the natural inclination, at least I had when I first started was water should be free. It's a human right. Everyone deserves to have safe water. And in Assam, we've actually deployed 179 systems uh, earlier this year where the water is completely free. And it's a 24 month operation maintenance contract we have with the public health engineering department. It's an arsenic iron removal system. However, what happened was there was an election and we were very nervous because in now, thankfully the ruling party remained in power. The chief minister, however, did change. And what that meant was if for any reason, A, the political party changed or B, um, you know, there's still a level of uncertainty with the new chief minister. If there is a lack of political will to re-up the O&M contract for these 179 arsenic iron removal plants, 
then all of these people who live in these hard to reach areas who are habituated to access safe water for free will no longer have access. And so there's a real question of continuity. And I think that's the issue at hand. Uh, you know, when we work in uh, Wasa with Dhaka and Chattagram, uh, there's a clear tariff. And so even if you have changing winds politically, there's at least um, a willingness to pay that will shield kind of this low income population from political economy and political interference. I think that's the real challenge. I think when we look at the next 50 years, how can we maybe cluster together different management models so that the economics makes sense to where maybe you have some areas be free and other areas be where you charge a tariff so where you can sustainably manage water access without being so uh, sensitive to political winds. Um, so that's kind of the last thing thought I wanted to leave with you. Uh, thanks and I'll look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Minhas Chaudhry, uh, the CEO of Drinkwell, for your uh, presentation. It's, it was really, really good to see. Uh, you mentioned safe water will be one of the expensive ones. Uh, that is that is really, really uh, uh, striking, striking uh, uh, comment uh, statement to start with, and that is very, very important. Um, I once heard that if there was a third world war, that would be on water or clean water. So that's quite interesting to get the scenario of how important water is to human life. Um, thank you for your presentation. And like uh, uh, we said, we will hear our three speakers for this session, and then we will go to the question and answer. Uh, and with this, can I uh, invite Rubat Sawa, um, the Managing Director and Lead Consultant for Innovation Consulting Limited, um, Mr. Sawa will be looking at how the challenges related to WASH interventions can be solved through multi-stakeholder partnerships. So he is holding the solution end to as a speaker to this session, I am guessing. Uh, so let's see, hear him out. Um, the floor is yours. Floor is yours. Not I'm, uh, I'll be mindful of the time. Um, so uh, I don't have the panacea or all the solutions, but uh, my deliberation fits very well with uh, Minhaz's because he was in effect explaining how multi-stakeholder partnership is pivotal for wash solutions. And if you, you have, you'd have noticed in his slide, you had all the different types of stakeholders from WASA to DPHE to also USAID. So, um, I mean, uh, I'd like to uh, break down my deliberation into two parts. Firstly, I want to speak to you about some of my findings from a work that I did for uh, the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation who hired me to look into the WASH systems in Bangladesh and find out um, how multi-stakeholder partnerships uh, were supporting scalable and sustainable solutions. Now, being a systems practitioner, what I then found out through my investigation in the sector was, was uh, very interesting for me. Um, I'm, I'm, and what I was seeing is that uh, there were, I mean, some very strong evidences and some very strong um, uh, uh, trends uh, about multi-stakeholder partnership. What we mean by multi-stakeholder partnership is that it can be a private sector and a public sector partnership. It can be a private sector and a private sector partnership. It can be a private public community partnership. It can be private and not-for-profit partnership. Um, we were seeing all sorts in, in the wash sector and some of it actually have come up in the examples that our panelists were speaking about. And, and what we, we saw is that uh, the NGOs are playing a key role uh, in Bangladesh in conceptualizing and testing and piloting some of the wash solutions. And, and what happens is that once the NGOs pilot it or they support the pilot, the scale often happens through the private sector. That's what we're seeing here. Um, so the, the pilot is being done through public funding and then the scale up is being done through private funding. We see that, but also what we see is that the private sector comes up with a solution like Drinkwell or Happy Tap, and that is being scaled by the NGOs or the pu pu private public sector, which is happening for their case. So we are seeing both playing a key role um, in, 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 in the scale and, and from R&D to scale of, of sustainable water solutions in Bangladesh. Now, also, if you look at the historical evolution, 
Um, there are some very interesting um, partnerships that went throughout these 50 years. And because we're talking about 50 years, it's important that I highlight some of this. So after 1971, I mean, we first started with DPHE and UNICEF, uh, which launched a joint program to scale um, to well as, as safe water solutions. But soon uh, what they saw is that um, they needed local entrepreneurs to, to, to scale their um, uh, marketing. So they involved small scale um, uh, uh, producers uh, who, who were producing it and then eventually marketing it. So, um, sorry, just give me a second. Um, Yeah, so, um, and then uh, what we saw is that, I mean, that was the kind of um, technology innovation by, by the public sector, which was being scaled up by the private sector. But then, uh, like Mr. Carlos Thomas was speaking about arsenic contamination, when that started, we saw uh, technology innovation being made jointly by the public and the private sector, and there was a joint effort for scaling up. Uh, so they, they were promoting ponds and filters uh, as a strategy to, to tackle that challenge. Now, after years of, of this engagement, uh, there, there was the need of, uh, I mean, further scale up. So, um, I mean, and in the sanitation sector, for example, uh, we saw engagement of uh, rural entrepreneurs who were taught by DPH engineers to produce concrete ring uh, to line pits and concrete slabs with pan and water seal. And they were eventually, um, I mean, scaling this. So uh, all through, and then we also spoke about social mobilization, which was also a public-private NGO collaboration. And uh, so throughout our history of 50 years, there were very specific trends and successes that was, uh, I, mean, I mean, that happened because of multi-stakeholder engagement. So uh, like I said, we, we saw innovation that were led by public sector, but scaled by private sector. And then we saw the opposite of it. And then we saw the joint collaboration. And then finally, we saw innovation led by the public sector itself and scaled through community-based organizations and local government agencies. So this integration of all these actors are very important. Now, the second part is that what I, what the, I mean, we need to be mindful about the challenges that are unfolding in front of us. And what I see from my research in the field is that there is a huge inclusivity challenge. So let's say the women in rural areas, if, if, I mean, if your latrine is far away from your home, it's very difficult for them to go to the latrine in the evening. So uh, that is one challenge. If the access to water, drinking water is very far away because the women usually fetches the water, it's very difficult for them. So we see an inclusivity challenge for the women. We are seeing a huge inclusivity challenge for the people with disability who, who I mean, many of those households, I mean, of, of whom the, I mean, they have people with disability, uh, they are having, they are struggling with, with access to sa sanitary latrines and uh, water, clean say, drinking water. And, and the same goes with marginalized households. And if you look at actually the composition of the 12% of the extreme poor, you will actually see that we are talking about all these marginalized households, people with disabilities, uh, and people in, in remote areas and people in Chitawong hill tracks or, or, or let's say, I mean, the indigenous communities composing a big part of, of these extreme poor, poor people in Bangladesh. And then we have the challenge of climate change. So let's say Indian Purishot every year supplies latrines and then within 12 months there is a flood and the latrine is gone. So we are continuously seeing the shift of, of the need. So that's also a big challenge of climate change. So how are we going to let's say um, mitigate all of these challenges? And the answer lies in the history as I said I mean, it, it lies on either the public sector providing the funding, as Drinkwell was saying, I mean, let's say so that they can start to do some pilot and then scale it, or it can be through the private sector who would be bringing in the innovation, but the public sector would be key in scaling it, and therefore the public funding would be very important, and PKSF model, as was shown for access to finance for WASH, that's also a very interesting model that we are seeing uh, evolving also with support from World Bank. So, um, so, so this would be very key in, in, in scaling uh, pilot from our 
I mean, taking war solutions from pilot to scale. So I, I would say that multi-stakeholder engagement would be, would be key, but within that, we need to have a commercially viable model. And the question is, can, I mean, sanitation and water, to what degree it should be free, to what degree it should be paid for, uh, to what degree there'll be a balance. And I think, I mean, the answer that we are getting here is that it would be a subsidized sector for it to be scaled. And that subsidy needs to come from certain sources. And to, 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 as of now, it has been the government and the NGOs and the development uh, partners in Bangladesh providing it. And probably in the future, it has to also come to innovative uh, wash finance solutions where the startups can play a role. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robert Sawa. I think uh, you have uh, provided quite a comprehensive understanding of the sector and as well as looking at some benchmarking exercises. I think that that is really, really good to find and how important it is to have an end-to-end -end solution to every every aspect of it. Wash is not uh, something that is remotely not part of our everyday life. It should be integrated by all means. Um, can we uh, have the closing remarks first uh, from our um, uh, main speaker and then can we move on to the question and answers, please, because I'm, I'm very much mindful of time. Uh, so I would like to request the host to give me the slide for, for our concluding remarks, uh, speaker Dr. Hussein Zillur Rahman. Executive Chairman TPRC, and we will be very much looking up to you, sir, to sort of uh, tell us how much we can achieve, and uh, in a in a like the the session goes, innovative way. Should can we uh, find a solution, a long-lasting one, and a sustainable one for this? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Saida Saima Ahmed, and. I don't uh, need the screen, I'll just speak. Uh, so uh, first of all, it was a very, very enriching session, starting with Dr. Khairud's presentation and the uh, many aspects of the WASH agenda that has been covered by the very, very competent on the ground active uh, panelists. So I think this is, uh, in a way, it has been very comprehensive. Uh, and uh, it's useful to start off with the a sense of uh, accomplishment that this 50 years, uh, and I think that has been noted by many how and where we have uh, made our progress on this agenda. On that particular segment of our achievements, I just want to add two additional aspects which actually underpinned the successes we've had so far. And I'm sure all the participants will agree with me on these two points. I just want to bring them out uh, in a more explicit one way. Uh, first is that, you know, if I take uh, sanitation, Bangladesh actually really succeeded by not Imagine, imagining the end goal right away. We succeeded by identifying the appropriate intermediate stops. So if you look at sanitation, open defecation, you know, the success on that, we didn't move from open defecation to a very safe sanitation right away. We initially focused on just changing the behavior. That the latrine may be unsanitary, but please don't go for open defecation. Throughout the 90s, that was the key achievement. We managed to transform the behavior of what we call now a fixed point defecation from open to fixed point defecation. That took us a decade, but that actually laid the condition for the next stage where you'd gradually improve that fixed point defecation at various stages of sanitation improving you know, from hanging latrines to ring slab latrines to you know, latrines with water to safe water, et cetera, et cetera. So this I think is an important part of our journey that on this wash, we need to identify these intermediate stops because we are not going to reach our end goal right away. 
So we need to really get those uh, the uh, the uh, end goals. Uh, so intermediate stops well identified, even in the context of now say hygiene or even on water. That's how we are doing it. The other part is also that some of these technological innovations has been characterized by what I would call low entry barriers for new market players. If you look at the ring slab part, the one that uh, Rubayat Sarwa was mentioning, the DPHT UNICEF, when they, uh, there was the tube well, but also the, uh, the latrine part of it, the ring slab, you know, there is a ideal sort of a ring slab model of DPHE, but it spread fast because less than the ideal, but actually it spread because the technological entry barriers was very small. So lots of market players could just get engaged quickly. So this is also important when you're thinking of the wash technological solutions, they are the entry barriers too high for a wide range of you know, domestic market actors to get engaged. I think that's also something that has been our, one of our strength. Now, in terms of, uh, I think what has been achieved, that a lot of has been said, I might may add some value by really focusing on the next stage, the next 50 years, so to say. And there, I think uh, many of the speakers have mentioned it, I think it's very important to take into account certain critical contextual changes as we are embarking on the next 50 years. One of the key contextual change is urbanization. Urbanization actually brings a different type of challenge, say for sanitation. Fecal sludge management has been mentioned. This wasn't an agenda 20 years ago. It has to be an agenda now. So urbanization is, we have to factor that in in all sorts of ways. Climate change is also a meta trend. We have to factor that in. Why? Not just arsenic contamination, huge part of Southern Bangladesh is now suffering from salinity challenge. You know, the water, uh, in, if you go to Kulna, Shatkira, et cetera, salinity intrusion has become a major issue. And that is of course, implications for the water agenda itself. So urbanization, climate change, and now the pandemic has also really hit home the whole urgency of the hygiene agenda. Hygiene has been mentioned, you know, wash the last alphabet H is hygiene, but hygiene has been a footnote so far in the uh, wash agenda and mostly limited to some limited awareness program. And that, that's the pandemic has actually has brought a whole new urgency to this issue of that, the last alphabet, the hygiene, as a standalone agenda in its own right with multiple action points to be identified. So I think this is uh, the contextual changes that we are talking about has to be, taken on board. The policy makers, Hyrule made a point that whether we have a problem of sort of complacency on earlier achievements, where the new contextual challenges are not being adequately appreciated. I think that's a very important one. And it also means in terms of even, for example, social campaign awareness program was mentioned many of the earlier awareness successes were targeted to individual behavior change. But now it is no longer a, a fecal sludge management will not happen only by focusing on the individual behavior change. It is also about institutional behavior change, the supply change, supply chain points, you know, behavior change multi-stakeholder uh, engagement has been mentioned already. So 
in terms of behavior change, also there is a transition. It's not enough to just think of the individual as the only target for such behavior change agenda. We have to actually think of institutions and, and multiplicity of uh, stakeholders which need to be uh, brought on board. New action agenda has emerged. FSM has been mentioned. I was surprised that public toilets has not been mentioned. That's also a very important urban agenda, actually. And Bangladesh uh, is rather, uh, rather behind on this particular issue of public toilets. Very important agenda. Unpacking hygiene, as I already mentioned, I want to re-emphasize that. There is a huge range of action points to emerge. So as still now, our hygiene agenda is being understood as a awareness campaign issue only. But there are you know, many other action points which have to be thought of. I think the person who was mentioning about uh, the, that it's not enough to just tell people wash hands away, there is no public stations. So facilities, awareness, uh, behavior change of targeted groups like, for example, school health is a critical agenda to take on board here as a whole. You know, menstruation was, MSM was also mentioned. So the uh, unpacking the hygiene for this decade, that is a vast agenda to be taken on board. There are action points to be identified where exactly we need to work on. One critical weakness, in particularly in terms of uh, uh, facilities, which has been mentioned, is the poor attention to ONM. Even if you go to elite institutions, say Dhaka University is an elite education institution. But unfortunately, the toilets in that university, uh, you'd be reluctant to visit those because this ONM part has not been real and really addressed much. Someone mentioned about, uh, I think Rubayat Sarwan mentioned about BR and their fear about uh, how the ONM uh, um, attention might be dropped if there is political change. ONM is a very, very important agenda and that has not been sufficiently appreciated. We need to really look at, and it touches on water, it touches on hygiene, it touches on sanitation also. All of the three agendas in WASH, the ONM agenda within those sub-agendas have to be really thought about. Finally, I want to come uh, to the policy issues, the policy agenda. I think one issue is, you know, uh, Hyrule mentioned about my, our work on budget advocacy on WASH. Uh, and it is, I think, an important issue here, which has not been mentioned much. I saw one in one of the chat, one of the comment there, that database is also a very important issue here. Because if you're talking of evidence-based policy pushes, it would require credible data on various aspects of it, on usage, on behavior type, on facilities, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why the budget tracking is an important instrument to try and nudge policy making. But as a whole, I think we have, while the substantive agenda waits to be addressed, we also have a immediate policy agenda of driving home the urgency of let's say WASH 2.0. Because WASH 1.0, we have achieved, and our policymaking mindset is still focused on WASH 1.0. But I think we now need to pose it in this manner that WASH 2.0 is on the table, and that requires a different type of sense of policy urgency. We really need to take on that board, and that would require, as I said, data evidence and new ways of actually persuading this policymakers also. I think that uh, agenda has not been, uh, that's this uh, policy influencing as an activity in itself, creatively. Innovations is not just about 
technology. Innovation is also about policy influencing. We really have to really address that. But I will uh, end by uh, focusing on two other aspects of policy. One is the whole thing about the ensuring the pro-poor uh, aspect of it. Because if we too quickly conclude on say market solutions to this, we will end up with a large part of the population not getting these services. It, the inclusivity challenge that Rubayat Sarwar also highlighted, Hyrule also highlighted, and others, Hasin Jahan, I think, mentioned that in a chat box comment. So public investment is critical. The policy advocacy is not just about you know, another policy document. It's about actual scaling up public investment in this area, actual budget. Budgets have to speak whether the policymakers are being serious. That's the sort of agenda we have to really push. Public investment is absolutely critical. But after that, there is no question that what has been mentioned about the multi-stakeholder sort of uh, partnerships. I would be wary of this public-private partnership language. I think we may need to perhaps revisit because sometimes language is invented for a good purpose over time, get appropriated by uh, other interests. This multi-stakeholder <clears throat> partnership and within that, we need to also identify which are the key stakeholders. Local government institutions have been mentioned, very important uh, stakeholder. Uh, relevant uh, market uh, innovators in terms of delivery. Technology innovators have to be mentioned. NGOs, of course, are there. But I think this multi-stakeholder engagement of a in WASH 2.0, also that is a big agenda. And it's not a one size fit all. For example, for uh, water delivery in low income communities in urban centers, one type of multi-stakeholder engagement is necessary. In the hill tracks, maybe a different type of, you know, remote locations, a different type of uh, multi-stakeholder partnership is necessary. So we have to think of not just one model for multi-stakeholder partnership, but context-specific models which work. And here also, I would very strongly underline the word accountability. Because at the end of the day, we need to really be convinced that there are results happening. Even with budgets, it's not enough that, okay, government tomorrow wakes up and say that I'll triple budget, wash budget. But all of it, that tripling of the wash budget also need to triple the outcomes of that from that exercise. It's not, a, we need to also um, put out that message, which means that how we monitor, how we hold budgets, actors to account, that is also very important. So governance in that sense is also a very important issue in the WASH 2.0. So I think that would be my take that it's a uh, WASH, this SDG 6 is a very critical agenda and it is not a SDG in itself, but it has multiple impact on the other SDGs too. So it, that centrality needs to be also underscored. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hassan Zalu Rahman for your valuable input as a closing remark. And I think it has been a very, very uh, productive uh, and um, interactive session uh, thus far. Um, we were supposed to finish uh, a, a good 20 minutes, 25 minutes ago, but we're slightly over time. Uh, you have already addressed some of the questions um, in your uh, speech, and that is the budget budgetary allocation. It was one of the areas. But if you could briefly touch upon, like why this has been reduced, uh, if you have any idea what why in the 2021-2022, whereas we have seen in the pandemic that 
allocation, further allocation is very, very, very much required in terms of recovering uh, from the whole process and actually prevention uh, or preventative approach as well. So if you could answer um, that question. Sure. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, the two uh, parts to that answer. One part is that, as, as, uh, as everyone has mentioned in this session, the urgency of the new challenges have not yet filtered through to the policymakers particularly the budgetary policymakers. So the, though we have been mentioning, the sectoral actors have been mentioning it, the urgency of addressing WASH 2.0 has not yet been felt. That's one of the reason why it is still seen as a, you know, another activity. But the other reason, the budget has not uh, met the expected needs in not just for the WASH sector, it hasn't also been met for the education sector or the health sector, the 21-22 budget. And partly the reason there, it's a mistaken, uh, I would say that policy thinking from the policymaker side, that the policymakers in Bangladesh in, in responding to the pandemic have over-focused on the issue of economic recovery. That has really taken up their uh, bulk of their policy attention. So they have tended to give all the attention to the idea of the economic recovery, the stimulus packages and all that. But the, uh, I think it is now sinking in 2021, 20, the new COVID wave has really driven home the idea that unless you can also address these issues, you are not also not going to get economic recovery soon. So I think uh, two things. One, they haven't appreciated enough, and perhaps advocates have not managed to explain enough why this attention to wash is more attention was is necessary. The other is that policymakers juggling between multiple policy uh, objectives have over focused on the theme of economic recovery and under focused on these social objectives. That would be my explanation. Thank you very much. Um, we have got uh, a few uh, questions. Um, I'm really sorry, I can see one hand up, but because of we've got very limited time and we need to hear the answers from the speakers, I would request uh, Ms. Hamara Chaudhary to put your question in the chat box, please. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, it's just that we don't have much time, uh, that's why. Um, so we've got uh, quite a few questions and I'm, I would request our speakers, uh, if you can volunteer to address them and sort of um, take the question that is um, relevant to you. So one of the questions that have said, that I've mentioned about accountability, uh, but also um, the things that how you monitor corruption in the area and trans ensure transparency. Uh, I think that is uh, another aspect that of policymaking and delivery, that how do we ensure uh, the transparency uh, and accountability to establish the organizations involved in WASH service be more people oriented. So it was by Kazi Munir Musharraf, India Forum. Uh, I, would, I would leave it to our speakers to take it as it suits you briefly to address this. Anyone from the panel? Is this a very difficult uh, question to address that how we find a solution to uh, making sure transparency and accountability? Yes, uh, Rabbi Sarah. No, I mean, of course that's not my practice area, um, but I mean, let's say when we're talking about transparency and accountability, um, I mean, let's uh, probably, I mean, if we take an example, that's when it would be, um, more appropriate to answer this question. So every year, the Union Parishad, uh, they distribute a lot of latrines. Now, um, so when we were uh, investigating or researching on, on the quality of the latrine being uh, collected, procured locally and supplied, we saw a huge, let's say, uh, issue. 
Now, I mean, definitely um, there, there's an accountability issue with regards to procurement and supplying it and durability of these latrines is very important. And that matter is not really being handled well. So, um, so now the question is who would then uh, uh, manage uh, uh, the accountability part of it? Now, um, I mean, one of our recommendations to ID actually, which commissioned us that work was to engage the communities so that if the community-based organizations were being active and vocal, um, if, if there was more power to the community-based organizations, then I believe, I mean, that would automatically lead to, let's say, more accountability from the union provincial side. I'm just talking in context of this example. So what probably we need to understand is, is the mix of, let's say, the beneficiary and the provider. And once we understand the, this mix of the beneficiary and the provider, we also understand who can probably support uh, the accountability. I mean, when I say support, what I mean is, is that who can probably uh, contain the container uh, within which this, can, this transaction can happen, right? Um, influence the power relationship. So that's where it gets uh, uh, complicated. I think Mark I want to also answer that question. He's on video. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ruben. I'll just come in for a minute. Uh, in line with uh, Rubai Dwai's answer, there is a strong need for people getting involved in the open budgets, which has been mandated by the local government, uh, you know, act uh, from at the ward level. So, and also there is a uh, you know mandated thing that at the mid year, uh, all the union position budgets also needs to be monitored. So, that portion of the whole accountability mechanisms in Bangladesh. It's not established, you know, to the level that it needs to be. So, we jai gatte jodi amra a investment ta korte pari. Ye bunga amader ei open budget gulo ke niye jodi amra agai jete pari. Ye bunga ei word meeting gulo pe shobar onshu gulo. Ye bunga chhika ne jokon shobar bolsi nari purush proti bundi manushya chahi da gulo ke. Tule niye shay jodi shayi bhabe kore amader local government er mani union purusha der budget gula kora hoy. Ye bunga ei je chhoy masher je একটা রিভিউ জায়গা আছে সেটাকেও যদি আমরা মানে ত্বরান্বিত করতে পারি এবং আমরা যদি সেটাকে কাজে লাগাতে পারি তাহলে এই যে জবাবদিহিতার জায়গাটা একদম মাঠ পর্যায়ে জবাবদিহিতা ইউনিয়ন পরিষদ তো আমাদের শেষ পর্যায়ের অ্যাডমিনিস্ট্রেটিভ একটা লেভেল সো ওই জায়গার এই জিনিসগুলো নিশ্চয়ই সম্ভব কিন্তু যেটা হয়েছে যে সিভিল সোসাইটি থেকে শুরু করে সবার আসলে ওইখানে একটা মনোনিবেশ করার একটা বিষয় আছে এবং সরকারের আসলে ওই সদিচ্ছার জায়গা থেকেও একটু কাজ করার বিষয় আছে থ্যাংক ইউ ফর গিভিং দ্য অপরচুনিটি Okay, Aprake Onik Dhonabad. Um, what I am uh, trying to do is we are actually uh, not having time. So what I can, <laughs> so I think I think what that is not, uh, I have been accused of being, uh, not giving females an opportunity to speak. Uh, Humaira Chaudhary, I would be very strict with you if you could finish uh, your question in one minute. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And uh, Saima, we are from the same department. Uh, I don't know if you recognize me, but anyway, uh, thank you no, for giving you me the opportunity. Sorry. I can't Saima. see you. The, uh, the... Okay, all right, here you go. Is it open now? All right, okay, so. Um, the reason why I want to speak, I mean, I want to speak because in Bangladesh, I am an entrepreneur, I am an entrepreneur, if not just the only one in obviously working with public and private sector. So, in my experience, I have learned that I have learned that I have learned that with the innovation. যে আপনারা যেটা করেছিলেন দু বছর তিন বছর আগে যে সমস্ত স্কুলে একটা ওয়াশ মানে ওয়াশরুম থাকবে সেটার সঙ্গে যদি ড্রিঙ্কিং ওয়াটার অ্যাক্সেসটা থাকে পিওর ড্রিঙ্কিং ওয়াটার তাহলে হয় কি যে আপনার এটা সম্ভব হয় বা যেটার সঙ্গে অ্যালাইন করে যে তখন একটা থোক বরাদ্দ আসে প্রত্যেকটা স্কুলে এটা সম্ভব হয় করা তাহলে হয় কি যে বাচ্চাদের যে এই যে ক্রনিক পেট খারাপ বা ডায়রিয়া বা আরো যে কলের টলের যেগুলো জীবাণু থাকে সেগুলো কিন্তু পানি যদি ভালো খায় ড্রিঙ্কিং ওয়াটার যদি পিওর খেতে পারে তাহলে কিন্তু সেটা হয় না তো এটা যেহেতু এবার যেটা 
হোসেন জিলুর রহমান ভাই বললেন যে এবার বাজেটে সেই অ্যালোকেশনটা আসার সুযোগ ছিল না স্কুল গুলো বন্ধ অন্যগুলো বন্ধ যেটা হচ্ছে কি নেক্সট বাজেটের জন্য uh maybe what it can work uh, mane work with the government and see with lgd ministry of uh, uh, thank you you know ar arekta arekt arekta jeta ami bolte chhen je to amra mathe kaj korechi ami goto bochor ekta year kaj korechi ta rubat jane minaz o somot sheneche je amra kintu pirojpur prothom saline water theke drinking water amra korechi এবং এটা একটা পাইলট প্রজেক্ট ছিল যেটা এখন পুরো সাউথ বেঙ্গলে আশা করছি আমরা রেপ্লিকেটেড হওয়া শুরু করবে কিন্তু এটা কিন্তু ওই ছোট ছোট খালি ওই ওয়াশ প্রজেক্ট গুলো না এখানে যে অনেকগুলো এনজিও যারা আছেন আর এনজিও যারা আছেন আমরা অভ্যস্ত হচ্ছে ছোট ছোট প্রজেক্ট করে ইটস টাইম না টু গো ফর লার্জার প্রজেক্টস ইনভলভিং দ্য হোল ইউনিয়ন অর দি হোল উপজেলা পরিষদ আমরা যেমন 12টা ইউনিয়নের শুরুতে প্ল্যান বসিয়েছি আমরা আগে ইন্ডিয়া করেছে থার্ড ফেজটা এখন শামি So these are the things that are happening. So 2100 Delta plan ke align kore. Ekhani jita ho chhe, ekhani academia jita ho neki chhe. Thank you. The agbari 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 bolen, arsenic bolen. I'm so sorry, Mara Tawzin. Uh, uh, thank you very much. But if you can have the question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your input. um can i just draw the attention of our organizers uh, that we have got really really good questions and if these questions could be emailed to our esteemed panelists and they can actually do a bit of answer for each question and then we can forward them to the relevant uh, um person who has raised it because i think it's very very important we do have a feedback from the session because otherwise this is going to go in 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 a loop i am very very mindful of time we have run over uh, nearly 40 minutes so this is not something that i am used to uh so um i would like to thank each and every one of you who have joined here and it, this was a tremendous 100 participants at one point so i think that this is a pure success in terms of showing how much wash is important and how much everyone is doing in this sector uh and with this i would like to conclude today today's session thanking each and every one of you who have make up your time from your busy schedule to join us raise questions give comments and uh, been a part of uh this journey and i wish you all a very good luck and just taking away private and uh, and the public sector working hand in hand is something bangladesh would benefit no doubt and this sort of conversations please keep them rolling and i think this is where uh, the major innovative and creative solutions can come forth and uh, thank you very much and have a good day thank you saima